bespoke radio for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. I need your help to get to the year 1985. To Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. All right, what's up? Fade to Black on a Monday. Yeah. Uh, back in the chair. I feel like I never left. How you doing? This is Fade to Black. This spoke radio for the masses. All right, all right, let's go. Today's Monday, August 31st. 243 days into the new year. 122 days left. We are live from the City of Angel Studios right here in downtown Burbank, California. COA Vapor, makers of the Fade to Black E-Juice. It's called Fader Loops. Just go to the COA banner, jimmychurchradio.com. You can do it right now. Use the promo code Jimmy for the Fader Not Special. Get yourself some free shipping. I would like to welcome everybody listening all around the world, all across the United States, hither and thither, to and fro, back and forth, up and down, east and west, far and near. This is Fade to Black. For KJCR and the Game Changer Network and KGRA, the planet, I am your oh-so-humble host, Jimmy Church. Sleep-deprived, roasting in Burbank, Jimmy Church. Tonight, we have very special guest, Jennifer Batten, is here. Jennifer Batten. So excited, so fired up about this. What, you know, just what a cool musician. That's all I got to say. She has been there and done that, and uh, I can't wait. She is, uh, she's so very cool and and so talented. But we're gonna go, we're gonna go. Well, we're gonna go the music side of things tonight. Of course, we have to do that. Is Jennifer Batten? But there's another side to Jennifer that uh, I can't wait to explore tonight. And I'll say this: she just tweeted out. I'm looking at her tw- Twitter feed right here. It says. Tonight, I'm going to be talking UFOs and Michael Jackson. (laughs) Like, right on, Jennifer. So there you go. Um, We were just uh, texting right before the show. And she is on tour right now. And we got lucky. Tonight, uh, she's off. She's literally going to be uh, talking to us from her tour bus. And uh, and there you go. They're 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 in route. It's all good. It's all good. It's fantastic. So tonight, Jennifer Batten. Now check out. We start off the week with you know somebody like Jennifer that I have looked up to and respected since uh, since we both were kids. Um, but tomorrow night, Von Setyan is with us, and we're uh, that's it's going to be a revolutionary evening tomorrow. Okay, so we're going to set this record straight on on ancient history tomorrow night. It, it's just going to be extraordinary. And then Wednesday, Larry Holcomb's going to be with us. And uh, I was listening to a show the other night with Larry where the announcer introduced him as Larry Holcomb. So on Wednesday, I'm going to set that record straight. Larry What's the deal with your last name? Anyway, it's Larry Holcomb on uh, Wednesday night. Presidents and UFOs. FDR through Obama is his new book. Thursday, a very special broadcast with David Hatcher Childress. So how was that for a week? Just when he thought last week. Wow. 
So that's our week this week on Fade to Black. I think uh, next week we should just take the week off and go to replays. I'm going to need it. Uh, so there it is. Uh, call in number tonight, as always, is 323-825-5045. And if you want to Skype in, you can Skype in Fade to Black and the number 14. I want to thank everybody, uh, all the Fader Knots, for, for hanging out with me in Twitter on Saturday night when I was over uh, guest hosting at Coast to Coast. You guys made it just a wonderful, warm evening. And the the cool thing about doing Coast is for the listeners that listen to this show and you go over and you listen to Coast, well, you know, it's it's you know, it's just it's it's like home, right? For the new listeners to this show tonight that are listening from Coast on Saturday that have never heard of Fade to Black or anything like that, and they're over here listening to you're gonna see that, you know, it's 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 cool. For me to go over to coast and what we do here, it's 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 not the same thing, but it's the same thing. And I was so comfortable, so cool, had such a good time. Why? Because to my left, I had my fade to black F2B Twitter feed. I had it in in spades, and I was able to just check that out and and uh, and it was just it was just an extraordinary experience. So thank you for uh, hanging out uh, with me on Saturday night. It was a fun show. It was a good show. It was cool. Um, somebody had mentioned, Jimmy, it doesn't sound like you. I even got a couple of emails. The difference is, and uh, first off, it's a different microphone, a different, but that's not what it is. What it is over there, you stand. Listen. You stand, okay? George Nori stands when he does his show. That studio is custom built. It's bespoke for George Nori. It's a bespoke George Nori studio. So you stand. It's a podium, okay? So those pictures that you see of me in the studio, I'm standing. You don't sit. And so that changes the way that you breathe and the way that everything comes out of your ass. It's just a different tone, you know, because I'm not sitting. And it just makes a difference. It, it really does. You're, you're stretched out. So, you know, eh, it's a different microphone. And it's also 10 o'clock till 2 o'clock in the morning. I'm going to have something to do with it. But, no, you're standing over there. You're standing. All right. Where am I? Man, I'm fired up. Jennifer Batten in just 20 short minutes. Don't forget, we are just three weeks away from the MUFON Symposium, September 23rd through the 27th down at the Hotel Irvine. Yes, come on, Fader Knots, come on down. Check it out. Do the Hangar 1 uh, hangout meet and greet. Just come on in. Just, just come and hang out, support MUFON, and, uh, and hang out with us. Uh, there is a bar there. You will find me there after <laughs> after the Hangar One Hangout. Okay, we'll all be over at the bar, guaranteed. And uh, don't forget, Race Hobbs is going to be there. Chase Kletsky is going to be there. So all of the KGRA family. Um, I'm, I'm, hey, hey, Race, text me. Who else from KGRA is going to be there? Tweet it out right now. Let's see if, if Race is actually paying attention. Race, tweet it out. Who else from KGRA is going to be there? All right? We're going to knock it down. It's going to be awesome. And then uh, September, October, November, about a month later, the Skyfire Summit is going on with uh, Travis Walton. That's November 5th through the 8th. Then, uh, wow, there's a... Uh, there's the, uh, UFO, uh, convention that's going on up at Laughlin. Uh, so yeah. And we'll be, uh, you know, uh, doing some announcements with that. I think we're going to be there for that too. And so is George Nori. And uh, I think maybe Chase race is Chase going to be in Laughlin too. So anyway, a lot of, uh, conventions coming up over the next, and then right after that, it's weird. As soon as you take the quiz, Christmas break, we come back off of that, and we'll be doing Conscious Life uh, at LAX. So uh, it's going to be a big convention season out there. All right. Um, oh, oh, little secret stuff. That TV show that I was taping, uh, 
Oh, when was it? It was about three months ago when we we posted some stuff out. Uh, just a few minutes before showtime tonight, I haven't even had a chance to tell Rita this, and she's going to hear it over the air now because it just it just happened. But uh, somebody, a, a producer from there, called and said that they've seen the preliminary cuts of the show, and they're really happy. And I was like, what? That, that, that's, all, that's all you can say? That's all I've got. But apparently everybody's happy, and I'm excited. And uh, so that's going to be I, – I, I should be just a week or two away from announcing what's going on with that. All right, let's see. Where are we today? Let's get the show cracking. Let's go. Today, actor Chris Tucker is 44 years old. Friday, the fifth element. Rush hour, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Chris Tucker, 44. Is he funny? Well, you know, he, he was funny. He was great in The Fifth Element. Friday, top 10 film all time, right? I'll, I'll go with that. You know, that's right up there with The Godfather. Chris Tucker, 44. That's our Twitter question. We'll come back to that. Van Morrison today is 70. Debbie Gibson is 45. You know what's funny about Debbie Gibson and Van Morrison in the same sentence? I haven't seen Van Morrison in concert. <laughs> I admit it. I did. I did. I did. I saw Debbie Gibson. saw her twice. Uh, Debbie Gibson, 45 years old. Our dead guy. I like Debbie. Debbie's cool. She's cool. Talented. Our dead guy's birthday today, James Coburn, 1928 to 2002, died at the age of 74. Just a total hard ass. Love James Coburn. He uh, he's gay. he always had those pipes too, didn't he? He appeared in all of the cool action films, and and one of my favorite spoof spy films of all times, Our Man Flint. And if you've never seen it, check it out. Great movie, Our Man Flint. Funny. He was in the Magnificent Seven, uh, Hell is for Heroes, Great Escape. Oh, I could I could go on and on and on. Um, anyway, uh, oh yeah, yeah. He was also the voice on the like a rock Chevy commercials on that campaign. Bob Seger did the music. James Coburn did the voice. He died of a heart attack November 18th, 2002 while listening to music at his home in Beverly Hills. Happy birthday, James Coburn. With that, let's get out of here. Let's get to our first break. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Excited on the Game Changer Network tonight. Jennifer Batten, right here on Fade to Black, bespoke radio for the masses. Game Changer Network and KGRA The Planet. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Do not touch that mouse. I'm going to be back a few short seconds with all the news that you know nothing about. I'll be back right after this. Listening to Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. Fade to Black will now pause for alien identification. The station that talks the net. KGRA Radio. What's up, revolutionaries? It's me, Jimmy Church. Do you have an IRS or state tax issue? Well, I did, and I called national tax experts. My problems were fixed, done, fini, and man, I got to tell you, it was a relief. National tax experts are a recognized tax office that services clients in all 50 states. It doesn't matter where you live. Give them a call. I'm telling you, they take the time to understand each and every client's individual financial status as well as their financial goals. And that's exactly what you need, my brother, when you're taking on the evil three letter. So, seriously. Give them a call today at 1-877-909-5444. Again, 1-877-909-5444. Or go check out their website, 
nattaxexperts.com. That's N-A-T-T-A-X-E-X-P-E-R-T-S dot com. Tell them Jimmy sent you. Nine out of ten geneticists agree. Fade to Black is not your father's radio show on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the planet. Hi, this is Chase Klutzke with Fate Magazine Radio, and you're listening to Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network and the KGRA digital broadcast station, where the Fade or Nots rock. Hi, this is Rob Reiner from Anvil, and you're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. What's up? I'm Chris. What up? This Mass- is Kyle Massey, and you're listening to Jimmy, Jimmy Church Radio. All right, welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. I wonder if Jennifer's listening right now to this bumper music. We'll quiz her when she comes on the show. Tonight, Jennifer Batten is with us. Tomorrow night, Vahan Setyan is with us. Wednesday, Larry Holcomb. Thursday, David Hatcher Childress. That's our week on Fade to Black. It's going to be great. Very excited. All right. (sighs) On this day in history, 1985. 1985, Los Angeles mob attacks the Night Stalker. Richard Ramirez captured him and nearly killed him by beating him (laughs) to within an inch of his life in East Los Angeles, California, after being recognized from a photograph shown both on television and in the newspapers. And those videos of that day are incredible. Absolutely incredible. And it was a big sigh of relief here in Los Angeles, too. I've talked about it so many times here on this show. But uh, it was uh, that was a crazy summer. And uh, Jennifer was here for that. We'll talk to her about that. Fader Facts. The earliest Europeans shared turf with Neanderthals. Around 45,000 years ago. That's a fader fact. Here we go. Let's get to all the news that you know nothing about. Long-term intake of Monsanto's most popular Roundup herbicide, even in very small amounts lower than permissible in U.S. water, may lead to kidney and liver damage, a new study just released. Yes, the research conducted by an international group of scientists from the UK, Italy, and France studied the effects of prolonged exposure to small amounts of Roundup herbicide and one of its main components, glyphosate. In their study, published in the Environmental Health, on August 25th, the scientists particularly focused on the influence of Monsanto's Roundup on gene expression in the kidneys and liver. In the new study, which extended the findings from one conducted in 2012, the team added tiny amounts of Roundup to water that was given to rats in doses much smaller than allowed in U.S. drinking water. That is frightening. Is there Roundup in your house? Let's uh, let's light up Twitter right now. How many of our loyal listeners right now have Roundup in your garage that spray Roundup in your house and around uh, who, who I hope the answer is none. It ain't here. Don't do it. I go out and I, I, I pull weeds. I get rid of weeds the old fashioned way. I pull them with my bare hands, a regional governor. And I look all of it. This is all over the web last week. I reported on this a couple of times. But now, today, a regional governor in Poland said today that he had serious doubts about the alleged discovery of a Nazi gold train days after a deputy culture minister revealed that he was more than 99% sure one had been found. There was no proof for this. I'm quoting here. There is no proof for this alleged discovery. 
than for other claims made over the years. Thomas Schmolz, uh, governor of the southwestern region of Lower Sicilia, said today. Two anonymous fortune hunters last week claimed they had pinpointed the Nazi-era train. I had my hopes up. Let's see Twitter here. Allison says, no, roundup. Stephen Knapp, no, I drink it straight. <laughs> uh, Mark from Oz says he pulls my hand. Karen McIntyre, no roundup. That's a negative from Stallone. No roundup from Mark Dunbar. Ryan, no, not me. I smoke them. That's that's actually very funny. Yeah, no roundup. No roundup. Okay, let's... Uh, Norick says, uh, hell to the no. <laughs> I pull weeds in the front yard and leave the milkweeds in the backyard to feed the migrating monarchs. Norick gets a T-shirt. That's cool. Let's see. Uh, Shallon Holt says, natural weed killer made with vinegar is the bomb diggity. No roundup in this guy's garage. Les says, no. Tammy says, Mark pulls weeds by hand. I never do. I, I think I think, uh, I think, that's what Tammy just tweeted. Okay. Uh, Boeing. Boeing. I love this. Check this out. This is where society is going. Boeing are putting the final touches on a portable laser system that not only tracks drones... It shoots them out of the sky with friggin' lasers. The Compact Laser Weapon System, <laughs> aptly named, uses technology similar to heavier systems already being deployed in military systems around the world. The U.S. Navy's LAWS weapon, for instance, was unveiled last year. Now, like the LAWS device and similar land-based systems, the Boeing weapon uses invisible directed energy beams to superheat any designated target in range. The laser beam follows vehicles in flight, tracking a particular spot for as long as it takes to ignite, <laughs> ignite, and disable the target. It's come to that. You'll be finding these at your local fries. What was that fries today? Oh, I meant to tell everybody. Okay, so... The Windows 10 issues that I was having last week on that computer that was shutting down and 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 it was it was updated looking for drivers. Turns out it was the monitor, not Windows 10. Well, it was Windows 10, and it was also NVIDIA. Those two are competing with each other right now for automatic downloads and, and uploads and updates of, of, of uh, uh, video drivers. So Windows 10 automatically updates. They don't let you know. They see a problem. Boom, they go out there, fish for it. NVIDIA has got their own NVIDIA experience program that runs in the background. They see the driver change, and it wants to install the latest driver. So now they're going in competition with each other and shutting monitors down. Okay? Now, that's, you can read about that all over the web. Just go to the NVIDIA forums. Go to Windows 10 forums, drivers, monitors. It's all over the place. Black monitor, no cursor in Windows 10. It'll, it, it, it's, it's all over the place. So I thought I was getting close. So I'm updating this and that. And, that, and it turned out the monitor itself was failing. <laughs> the monitor was failing. Pulled the computer, went to my computer guy today. Walk in, upset. I didn't know what I was going to do. Thought I had to back up a drive. I wasn't going to be able to do it. He plugs in the computer, uh, to him and it fires up, and there, it's working. I'm like, that's impossible. He goes, no, it's your monitor. So what did I do? I had to go to Fry's. So there you go. I. <sighs> It wasn't Windows 10. I still, it, it, it was Windows 10 because of this automatic update thing. And if this automatic update thing wasn't going on and locking up everything, it wouldn't have led me down the wrong path. This automatic update thing running in the background, when my monitor is failing here and it blips in the system, then it's shutting down and going out there looking for monitors during the show. 
You know, I, I don't need that issue. You know, think about that for a second. I want to be able to pick and choose when this thing updates. I don't need it to shut down in the middle of the show and just decide we're going to update because that's what it does. And that is frustrating. Bill Gates, listen to me. I got friends that work at Microsoft, too, and they just think Windows 10 is the greatest. And it is. It's a big, big change over Windows 8. I mean, it's it's they look like heroes, but this automatic update thing, I I don't know. And there's a automatic there's a rollback that you can do by the way at 30 days if you don't like Windows 10, you can go back to your previous system. So tempted to go back to seven. I'm I'm right there, right there. But the other computers here are running fine. So and now everything is okay because of these new monitors. So all right, where was I? Where was I? Right now, right now. Things are crazy on planet Earth. Right now, this second, four hurricanes, one in the Atlantic, and an unprecedented three at once in the Pacific, right now, are currently circling the Earth. Over the weekend, hurricanes Ignacio, Jimena, and uh, Kilo were all Category 4 hurricanes with winds of at least 130 miles an hour. Ignacio weakened, but it's still is a Category 2 hurricane. Today, the National Hurricane Center said Hurricane Fred developed in the eastern Atlantic. It's the easternmost hurricane that's ever formed in the tropical Atlantic. This is record-setting times right now. Four hurricanes on planet Earth at the same time. All right, let's get out of here. All right, re really quick. I don't report on ISIS. I stopped doing it. You know this. Man, that's my Chris Tucker. Man, that's my Chris Tucker. Chris Tucker's funniest movie was Friday, by the way. It wasn't Rush Hour. And Fifth Element, pretty good, but nothing compares to uh, Friday. He, he started at the top and then went downhill. The Islamic State has blown up parts of the Temple of Bel in Syria's ancient city of Palmyra. The Syrian Observatory for Human Rights said yesterday that the jihadist group had placed explosives inside the temple, at least partially destroying the building considered Palmyra's most significant and oldest pre-Christian temple. It's Roman, it's badass, and it's gone. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Jennifer Batten. She's going to be in the batter's box in just a few short minutes. Tomorrow night, Vahan Setyan right here. Larry Holcomb on Wednesday, Thursday, David Hatcher Childress. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Bespoke radio for the masses. Follow us on Twitter at JChurchRadio. Email is Jimmy at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Syndicated on KGRA, The Planet. I'll be back right after this. Stay with us. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. The station that talks the net. KGRA Radio. Hi, this is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. Today, everybody, the Fader Dots and Planet Earth is vaping. And I'm very proud to announce our very own e-juice. When we were approached by City of Angels Vapor about Fade to Black e-juice, I wanted to make sure that it was the very best and that the flavors were something that I could create myself. And we did just that. Introducing Fade to Black Fader Loops. This will take you right back to Saturday morning cartoons and your favorite bowl of fruity loopy cereal. Just click on the banner or go to www.coavapor.com. Enter the promo code Jimmy for the Fader Not Special. That's www.coavapor.com. Go back, Lee Tappy. Hi, this is Ray Sobs here repping the planet, and you're listening to my good friend, Jimmy Church, Fade to Black, on the Game Changer Network and the KGRA Digital Broadcast Station. Imagine no longer being tied down to your computer, but having the freedom to take live talk radio with you anywhere you go. TalkStream Live introduces our first ever iPhone application. The talk shows you follow now follow you. 
And your iPhone is now the fastest and easiest way to stay connected to the best talk radio on the Internet. Let TalkStream Live transform the way you listen to radio. Listen to live talk shows 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Mobile talk radio from TalkStream Live. Now available in the iTunes App Store. This is Toby Kebble. You're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Don't hurt me, Jimmy. I'm only little. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And this is Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. <laughs> we are of the Honey Brothers. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And I'm Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. And you're listening to Jimmy Church. The Revolution. Attention, all fade or not. Studio Dome has a special deal on their SD1 Bluetooth speaker. Just go to JimmyChurchRadio.com, click on their banner, enter the promo code Jimmy, and you get $40 off and free shipping on the SD-1. It's voice activated. Comes with a USB antenna, cables, and a carry bag. Never listen to your phone, tablet, or laptop speakers ever again. It's the only way to listen to Fade to Black. That's JimmyChurchRadio.com, Studio Dome banner, promo code Jimmy. Go back, Lee Tappy. This is Micah Hanks of the Graylian Report, and you're listening to Jimmy Church on Fade to Black. Across the globe on the Game Changer Radio Network and the one and only KGRA Radio, The Planet. <laughs> All right, welcome back. Fade to Black, the Monday edition. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. What is cracking, everybody? I want to make a little announcement. For those that wanted to blog or did blog on that other site that is down and gone, if you would like to blog and write for us here at Fade to Black, we will have a new page, and it's called Fade to Blog. So there you go. If you would like to contribute to uh, the website, just email Rita, Rita at JimmyChurchRadio.com, and let her know what you would like to do. We're getting stuff set up this week. With that, tonight, Jennifer Batten is with us. She's here. She's in the batter's box. Tomorrow night, Vahan Setyan is with us. We'll be talking Lost Civilizations and the Cradle of Civilization, some revolutionary stuff tomorrow night. Wednesday night, Larry Holcomb is with us. Presidents and UFOs is his new book, FDR Through Obama. And then Thursday night, a special broadcast with David Hatcher Childress from Ancient Aliens. He will be with us for the duration Thursday night. So we've got a great week this week. But tonight, it's Jennifer Batten. Jennifer began playing guitar at the age of eight when her father bought her, and I'm I'm quoting, a killer red and blue electric. I want to find out what that guitar was. She released her 1992 debut, Above, Below, and Beyond, followed by Jennifer Batten's Tribal Rage and then Momentum in 1997 and Whatever in 2008. She has authored two books, Two Hand Rock and the Transcribed Guitar Solos of Peter Sprague. Uh, she also appeared on recordings with Jeff Beck, Michael Cimbello, Brett Helm, and The Immigrants. Uh, the immigrants and her music video appearances include Jeff Beck, Michael Jackson, Natalie Cole, Sarah Hickman, and Miguel Mateos. She played lead and rhythm guitar on Michael Jackson's Bad, Dangerous History World Tours and on his 1993 Super Bowl halftime performance. And she played in Jeff Beck's band for three years from 1999 to 2003. She is currently on tour doing the Jennifer Batten Self Empowerment for the Modern Musician Experience Tour. Info, everything is over at jenniferbatten.com. I would like to welcome to the program Jennifer Batten. Hi, Jennifer. How are you? I'm doing just great. It's perfect timing. We just reached camp. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, Jennifer, where did you play last night and where are you playing tomorrow? I know you're on tour. Yeah, we played um, New Haven, C Connecticut last night. And um, tomorrow's actually a drive day. We got a long road to haul off to Cleveland. So we, we cut it up and did half the trip tonight and half tomorrow. Then, then we're doing Ohio, doing um, Cleveland, Columbus, Cincinnati, Indianapolis, and Chicago area. Right. Where are you playing in? Uh, is it all, uh, are you doing venues or clubs and uh, music stores and stuff? Uh, are you splitting it up? 
Yeah, there's there's a lot of different things going on, actually. As far as concerts, there's only about four or five of them on this trip. Um, and the rest of the dates are split up all, almost all in Sam Ash music stores, doing uh, clinics for some amazing new tech gear that's uh, life-changing. <laughs> right. And then also... Also doing the self empowerment for the modern musician seminar. Now, so we got a good variety. Let's do this, Jennifer. Um, I'm going to back up because you and I were in Hollywood in in the crazy fun days, and and uh, so let, I want to I want to back up to that time a little bit, and I also want to know about this this really cool guitar that you got for your birthday when you were eight. But um, back. Back in 1979, 1980, Musicians Institute, GIT, and everything, there was a, the guitar was such a, I want to say this the right way. You had Eddie Van Halen, you had Randy Rhodes, Yngwie Malmsteen was breaking out on the scene, it, and, and guitar was uh, blowing up all over Hollywood. And, and here you come along, and did you feel that you had to prove something uh, very early on just to let the guys know that you were serious? Yeah, I, I think that was in my mind for sure. And that's definitely why I put Flight of the Bumblebee as the first track on my first record. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just a little statement there. Yeah, that was Because it was, I mean, back, back then it was all about the speed and chops and silly acrobatics. So I, I did jump into that pool for a while. He, the, that was not nice, by the way, uh, by doing that. <laughs> and, 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 well, well, pardon me. <laughs> no, that's okay. You know the drill. Back then, everybody was uh, getting creative with the guitar and trying to outdo the next, uh, you know, the next uh, person in line, uh, trying to get down with some crazy acrobatic uh, acrobatics. And and if you had three arms, you would be using your third arm too as well. And and that's what was going on back then, and it was it was tough. And when you came along, uh, people started to talk. And and you know, it's one thing in the music world that's tough enough, but the guitar world is vicious. <laughs> that's a whole other. You know, guitar players are really competitive. And and here you come along, and you raised a lot of eyebrows, and people were talking about you very very early on. Did you feel that? Did you? Did you know what was going on in the streets back then? Um, I wasn't aware they were talking about me, but uh, it was a gunslinger kind of attitude amongst everybody uh, until music completely changed and nobody gave a crap about guitar, and then all of a sudden people <laughs> chilled out. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, I had told you before, uh, one of the guys that I had... I was in a band with was Anthony Cardenas, uh, uh, Tony Montana that went on to play in great white. And, mm. and I was hanging out with him one day in the early eighties and, uh, you know, playing guitar. And he goes, man, I got to split now because I've got to go take a lesson from Jennifer Batten. And I thought, <laughs> I thought he was like the, you know, the, the slingiest of guitar players, you know, really, really great guitar player. I looked up to him. And and I was like, wow, she really is that good? Because I had heard about you. <laughs> but I thought if, if, if Tony is going to take lessons from her, then the rumors uh, have to be true. You know, she's got to be is what, uh, what was happening. And then, of course, Michael Jackson happened, which seemed like out of nowhere. How did that audition happen? And, and how, how uh, did somebody call you or did you just get in line? Yeah, there was there was a guy from Michael Jackson's camp that had been with him for years since the Jackson Five, and uh, I guess it, it was his job to round up people to audition. So he called Musicians Institute, and I was teaching there at the time, and he called the referral service there and said, "Please send me two people," and I was one of the lucky people that got chosen. So I I asked when the last possible time I could audition would be. And two or three days later, I went in fully prepared with a handful of tunes, and there was no band. It was just me and a video camera that um, Michael would look at the tapes later. And the only guidance I was really given then was I definitely had to play some funky rhythm stuff because that was 90% of my job. So 
I improvised some stuff, and then I started soloing. I played uh, a Giant Steps tapping solo that ended up on my first record and ended with the Beat It solo because I had been playing that for a couple of years with cover bands, um, and I thought he might find that useful, <laughs> which, which he did. Now, it's kind of funny because after... 20, after 25 years, I just got a hold of that audition tape, and it's it's really kind of funny to to look at. I I look at uh, you joining Michael's band twofold. Number one, he is going to get the baddest ass player he can get, and so that's that. And you know that's who is auditioning. You know these aren't slouches. He's going to get the best guitar player out there, and he did just that. But he got this bonus of somebody that could uh, uh, look like you did on stage at the same time. It was your playing that got well, you in the band, but how did that come about? Well, now, that that's kind of interesting because I, I didn't look like what you remember me from Jackson's band when I auditioned. Uh, I, I looked like a geek with glasses, and I was a guitar geek. And fortunately, he saw through that and knew that he could do a complete remake and that whole look with the white mohawk was his idea. He wanted me to stand out. And there's several, well, tons of pictures out there of him on stage in the spotlight. And the only other thing that you see is my hair. So there's, he branded me with that. I, I was fortunate because he, my branding was automatic. And if it was up to me to create my fashion, you still wouldn't know who I am. <laughs> well, I'm going to ask you... Let me ask you a couple of questions about uh, this is one guitar player talking to another. The first time, the, the very first time you plugged in your chord into your guitar and played with Michael, the very first time rehearsal, were you nervous yeah. as crap? Tell me the truth. What, what was going through your mind at that moment? Well, the rehearsals were so intense that the whole first month, the band was in one room rehearsing by themselves, the singers in another, and the dancers in another. So we spent a solid month getting the, the stuff down and the, the, all the tones, and a lot of time was spent on sounds. So, And we had heard that when he walked in, if he was happy with what he was hearing, he would start dancing. So we moved the whole production to a giant production studio with everybody gathered together. And he walked in and heard us, started dancing, and things went well. So you uh, were you nervous or were you cool? Um, I, oh, I'm sure I had the jitters to, <laughs> to some degree, but I was more excited than anything. Because I, I there was so much anticipation uh, a whole month without meeting him. You know, it could go any which way. If he didn't like things, I, I could have been back home. You know, right. so I'm sure I, it was a lot of years ago, but I'm sure there was some anxiety. Now, also, you know, playing in cover bands and GIT and stuff, you're in control of your own environment and tones and stuff. But now you're dealing with an MD, you know, a music director. How much creative yes. control did you have over tones? And, and what guitar you were playing? Were you suddenly you know, having to listen to somebody else uh, for their judgment and maybe not necessarily what you would want to do? No, uh, I was really lucky. The MD was Greg Fellingaines, who's just a monster prodigy. He started playing with Stevie Wonder when he was still a teenager. Um, he's a very kind guy, fantastic musician, and he didn't have anything to say about the guitars that we were playing. There was... Uh, you know, a few things to polish here and there along the lines, but no, it was it went very smoothly. I mean, we we all wanted to do the best job possible, and uh, it was kind of like joining the army. And then we jumped in, and once you're there, you you don't go home. <laughs> yeah, right. In fact, I, I I hired somebody to take my dog down to my parents' house in San Diego because I was never home. So uh, it, it's a good army to join. With um, uh, the ability to now you're 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 in Michael Jackson's band. You, the two of you are on stage to get uh, with your image and the way that he looked. You know the, the audience is seeing the two of you, but that's that's one thing. That's image and that's theatrics. But your guitar 
is is right there. Your support, that's it. You know, you're you're a big part of the sound and the performance of what's going on. Did you realize uh, at you know, first off, you were very young if you think about it now, <laughs> looking back. And uh, did that ever come into play in your mind? Where here I am, I'm playing the best songs possible. You know, th- these are just anthems. And it, it's you yeah. that is actually creating this sound. And did, did, is, was that ever something that was intimidating, that you were just such a big part of what was going on now? Um, gosh, I don't recall feeling intimidated. I just was excited. I mean, everybody there was really excited to be having that experience. The first tour was a whole year and a half, and we were treated like royalty everywhere we went. We were just soaking in the, the experience. It was phenomenal. And I think most of us, well, I won't say most of us, but uh, several of us had never been outside of, uh, outside of America before. And he only played two or three days a week. So we had plenty of time to see the world. And uh, it, it was just a paid vacation, really. Now, before uh, we'll move on from Michael, uh, uh, there's there's so much about you that that uh, we we're going to talk about tonight. But was his vocal? Uh, was he always on, or did was there off nights? And could you tell? He he was extremely consistent. He was a consummate performer. He'd been doing it since he was five, and he definitely knew what's up. I think if if he was feeling off, I I certainly didn't see it. I didn't pick up on it at all. And the same same question goes for the band. Did the band always have off nights? But you know, you got the best the best musicians, you know, in the industry in this band. But did you guys have off nights? Were there nights where you just went, man, that sucked? No. (laughs) <laughs> that might sound arrogant, but with that kind of music, it's it's not like a whole night of improv, where if, if it's all improv, it really depends on how you're feeling that night, and you need to step it up to get through it if you're not feeling good. But I would say, God, such a large percentage of that show was playing parts, and we played the same parts every night. It was the same order of the songs every night, uh, because there was costume changes and pyro and you just couldn't change it up like a bar gig (laughs) (laughs) right 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 and yeah so pretty much uh the band itself and the structure that is that is going to be the same every night but were you able to stretch out on the guitar and 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 improvise when you wanted to well it wasn't at random but i i was the lucky one i was the only one that got to do that um now, so for something like Beat It, I had such respect for that solo. I had no desire to improvise. I wanted to do Eddie's solo, and I think it was such a famous solo. That's what people expected to hear. Uh, but there were songs like Working Day and Night that on the record, there isn't any solo at all. So he would just let me stretch and go and go and go and, until he felt like wrapping it up. So, so I, it, having said that, I'm sure there was nights that were better than others. For the following, for sure. Uh, who do you, who do you turn around and don't say Jeff Beck because I know that's the easy answer. And we're going to talk about Jeff in a bit, but who is it that you look up to when uh, uh, you listen to other guitar players? Who is it that that stirs your soul? You know, it's been different people over the years. When when I was a kid, uh, it was the Beatles and the Stones. When I was a teenager, I got into the blues really heavily. So it was John Lee Hooker, B.B. King, um, Sonny Terry, Brian McGee, that kind of stuff. Right. Uh, but I have to say, I heard Jeff in my teens, and it was a life changer. Now there's Brad Paisley. Yeah. Is a, I'll call him a new hero because it's a he's a monster player, and it's a completely new vocabulary for me. So it's it's exotic to me because I didn't grow up listening to country music, and he's well. He's not just country. He has all kinds of different elements in his improv. So to me, that's really exciting. And then there's, I just spent the day with Joe DiOrio, who's a monster jazz player, and he taught at Musicians Institute for quite a few years, living in Connecticut. And uh, he was a huge, huge, huge influence on me. Just a very, very creative soul. 
he got into a big intervallic playing large skips on the guitar, which is kind of oddball. And I just loved it. Yeah. Uh, so, those are my heroes. Yeah, Diorio and guys like him. They just, it, you sometimes you just say to yourself, you know what, I really don't know how to play. <laughs> you know? <laughs> of course. <laughs> it's just like, I got well, that's, that, that's what keeps you stretching. You know, you get inspired by all these different people and incorporating different things just keeps it exciting, keeps the fire in the belly. And and as far as the rock and roll guys that are out there today, uh, or maybe not out there today, but some of the more modern guys, uh, you know, going back to maybe like Dimebag Daryl, who's no longer with us, of course, but yeah, uh, Zach Wild. Do you ever do you ever check those guys out and and talk to them too as well? Um, I I did see Zach play with Ozzy. And admired him. Um, I never met him, but I, I've run into different players over the years. One one of my favorites in that genre, I suppose, is uh, George Lynch. Oh yeah. I really. I wasn't a real big fan of Dawkins, but I was a big fan of his guitar playing. You, you, when you go back and you listen to those early Dawkins records, uh, that's it's so true. Yeah. You may not listen to Don. But you listen to George and the way that the songs were constructed and the way that he was doing things, he was definitely, you know, he was a groundbreaker back then. And, you know, the, yeah. I think guitar players realize that, but he's kind of lost in the in the history of music. He was so creative and influenced so many guys, but he's not, a, you know, one yeah. of those first name people that we think of. Uh, well, he's in my top ten for sure. Yeah, definitely, definitely. What about... Now, back in uh, back in the early days of the Strip, were you hanging out at you know Gazzari's and the Roxy and and the Whiskey and and the Troubadour? Were you checking out all those bands <laughs> back then? I wouldn't say I was hanging out. What I was doing was showcasing and hoping that people didn't steal my gear from when I <laughs> went to the car to the stage and back. Because when we were showcasing, it was always three or four bands a night, and it was uh, always stressful, hellish parking. But I. I just hated Hollywood, so I did not go down there and hang that much. I was always getting parking tickets and hating life. <laughs> it's changed so much, hasn't it? It's uh, you know it does. Do you look back at those days, though? I totally hear what you're saying, but th that was such a golden moment that it, it can't be recreated. You know what I mean? It was just a moment yeah. in time. It was pretty magical. It was so vibrant. Like, everybody wanted to play guitar. And I think the the kingpin was Van Halen. I mean, there's thousands of people that were all of a sudden interested in playing guitar because of the power of his music and creativity. Did you, uh, it changed the music industry. It, he probably it, sold more guitars than anybody since Hendrix. That is no joke. It uh, there's very few musicians that come along that where you can say honestly, there's music before this person and then there's music after this person. And Eddie's one of yeah. those guys that there's before Van Halen and then after Van Halen. You know, there's before Hendrix and after Hendrix, before the Beatles, after the Beatles. And Eddie is one of those guys that certainly changed it. And did he change it for you, too, as well? Did you run out and get a Strat and, and, and you know, get a Whammy and, and, and a Marshall modified by Jose, you know, like everybody did? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, I didn't go that far, but I was certainly influenced by him. And in fact, I, I wrote out every solo from the 1984 record, which was probably the most difficult transcriptions I've ever done in my life. But he was, he was oh, he's such an innovator. He, you just kind of, I don't remember ever waiting at the record store for a record to drop. You know, it's like countdown five days to 1984, four days. It was it was a big deal. It was very exciting, and he always had a new chunk of something or other that would just blow guitar players' minds, like Cathedral or Eruption. There was always something new every record that people were just salivating for. Yeah, my favorite still is Van Halen too. I don't know why, but that for some reason I just that 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 album is just my Desert Island record. Yeah, man, it's just that raw energy and creativity, and just the. Oh, the the vibrant, for lack of better word, aura of his solos. 
I mean, anybody can play those notes after he's played them, but the the force that he put into them was very unique. You know what else is unique? He was 21. <laughs> you know, <it's> like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, you got to think about that. You know, Mike Anthony and I mean, how they were—they were just kids. You know, Van Halen yeah. won. They were just they were just little babies, and that creativity was coming out. So uh, we're going to be up against a break. I wanted to ask you really quick before the break. Did any of your students uh, uh, go on? Uh, who, who did you teach early on that, that uh, is out there cutting it up now? Um, well, one that comes to mind is Peter Thorne. He's played with Chris Cornell. Um, boy, he's, he's got a long list I just read the other day, and I can't think of anybody else but he's always out there doing something anybody else um i'll probably think of them as soon as this show's over <laughs> that's right all right uh, that's how it works. when we come back um we're, i want to talk about jeff beck and then uh, and we'll talk about you and your creativity and and what you think about when you write and how you get that done um and i do like the title of this tour uh, empowerment. I think that is, is totally cool. And so we're going to get into all of that. But uh, with sure. with Jeff Beck, my favorite album, and I want to hear yours going into the break. My favorite Jeff Beck album is the Orange Album with Bob Tench and uh, Cozy Powell, Max Middleton. That that album for me, even though it was panned when it came out, that's that to me. You know, people want to say wired and blow by blow. I get that. I understand. But for me, it's the Orange album. What's the Jeff Beck album that blows you away? Uh, well, I'd have to say both, blow by blow and wired, because I, I learned every solo on both of those. Uh, that was a both life changing experience getting into those and and uh, playing along and learning. I mean, I recreated guitar so much of what rock guitar players do today came from Beck's inventions and most people don't even realize it. And the wicked sounds, the wicked harmonics, the, the ridiculously high bends. It's uh, that's a slice of history right there. Yeah. And you think about the dates, you know, think about when, when those albums were, were being cut at that time, certainly he was in the zone. He went, he, 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 an ET, an alien visited him and talked to him about guitar. I'm serious about that because it just came out of nowhere. He had some epiphany, yeah. something happened, and and his playing took a such a such a right hand turn. So let's take a quick break, Jennifer. When we come back, more with Jennifer Batten. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. It's going to be a great night tonight. We're going to find out seriously what it, what goes through Jennifer's mind when she writes those songs. We'll be back right after this. Stay with us. Way out here, we listen to Jimmy Church. You're listening to Fade to Black. Always on the edge of the hottest alternative talk, Jimmy Church with Fade to Black, KGRARadio.com. Hey everybody, what's up? Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and check this out. The 2015 MUFON Symposium will be held this September 24th through the 27th in beautiful downtown Irvine, California. Expanding ufology, opening new doors in academia, industry, and media. Former Defense Minister of Canada Paul Hellyer will be there in person. Former CNN news anchor Cheryl Jones, TV news journalist Jaime Musan, and MUFON's chief photo analyst Mark D'Antonio. They're just a few of the growing list of names for the 2015 event. It's September 24th through the 27th at the beautiful Hotel Irvine. Get your tickets today at MUFONSymposium.com. That's MUFONSymposium.com. Go back, Lee Tappy. ¿Qué tal, mis amigos? Yo soy Mario Carson, el tiburón. Y los invito para que escuchen a mi buen amigo Jimmy Church Radio. Claro que sí. 
Did you ever turn to your radio for your favorite talk show to find that it's been preempted for this? In the air, a deep right center. Back goes Lewis to the wall. Or this? And I'm ashamed of you, Hillary, for voting for it. Do you have a favorite talk radio program that's not available in your city? Just go to TalkStreamLive.com for links to the best streaming talk radio shows. At TalkStream Live, you will find live talk shows 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. All your favorites are here. With such a large selection, you will also discover some new favorites. On the go and still want to listen? With the mobile smartphone, simply type TalkStream Live on your internet browser. Now you can take internet radio with with you. You will also find hundreds of music, news, and sports streams. Best of all, the TalkStream Live directory is free and there's never a login required. Remember TalkStreamLive.com, the fastest route between you and your favorite talk radio show. You are listening to Fate to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Oi, oi, I'm Reese Evans. You're listening to Jimmy Church. This is Revolution. The Revolution will not be televised. The Revolution is on radio. Ciao. Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Jennifer Batten is with us. Musician, guitar player's guitar player. Ah, uh, yeah. I'm fired up. Hey, Jennifer, what do you think of that bumper music? Uh, I was spacing and talking to the aliens in my brain. I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's uh, Doug Aldrich. Do you know Doug? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah! Fantastic player. Yeah, yeah, he's uh, he's one of those cats, man. He can he can uh, he can spank the plank. He's a pretty pretty <laughs> tasty player. Those those tracks when we go into break each time, you listen to it. We those were recorded in a bedroom in Sherman Oaks. It's an album called Electrovision, and literally done with eight ads. <laughs> You remember ADATs. <laughs> ADATs. Oh, yeah, I did my second record with those. Exactly. Uh, ADATs in a bedroom. Everybody's dream, wasn't it? That was, uh, those, those were the good old days. It's so funny how it advanced... That was the beginning of self-empowerment yeah, right there. Yes, it was. It totally. And, uh, and how technical and how advanced we thought it was. And, and, and look at uh, the way today that we record. It's uh, such a difference. But anyway, yeah. yeah. Uh, Jeff Beck. Now, it's one thing. Uh, I'm going to ask you the same question I did when I, uh, about Michael. It's one thing to get up and, and play in front of Michael, but now, now it's Jeff Beck. Take me to that first moment where you had to play in front of Jeff. What was that like? It was it was really bizarre because I had met him on the Dangerous Tour in 92. And it was my number one focus of the tour since I knew we were going back to England to basically track him down and get that autograph and meet him finally. I, I had been in so many situations, like at the NAMM show, uh, somebody would say, hey, did you see Jeff? He was here five minutes ago. And I, <laughs> right. like, time after time after time, it, the connection was missed. So after every show in different countries with Michael, I would ask the Sony reps that were there, because Epic was connected, um, Jeff's label, if they knew him or knew how to get in touch with him and invite him to a Michael show. And eventually somebody came up with it, got him VIP tickets for Wembley Stadium that we were doing outside of London. And uh, crazy as it was, there was two opening acts that went on, and then Michael canceled the show. And Jeff had arrived late and was turned away at the gate. And that was, I thought, of all the days for Michael to cancel, that uh, is not a good one. Uh, so I, I called Jeff the next day and I said, well, I don't know when or if they're going to make up the show, but can I come meet you anyway? 
And he said, sure. So I went to the studio that he was recording his rockabilly record with the New Town Playboys and got to listen to some tracks. And I gave him a copy of my first CD that had just come out. And I also had done a video for Flight of the Bumblebee where I was covered in bees. And they were playing that on the, the midnight hour on MTV in London. And uh, I had just got a copy of that. So I gave him my CD and that video got my autograph. Uh, that was my bucket list done. I thought I'd never hear from him again. thought he'd probably never even listen to the record. Two months later, he called me up and said he finally had a chance to listen to the record properly, and he wanted to do a record with me. So, of course, I just peed my pants immediately. Right. <laughs> oh, man. And uh, actually, it wasn't until five years later that he called me up and said, he had a tour of Italy booked, and he wanted me to be on the tour. And I, I thought, I was really insecure about it, because I thought we had never played together before, and he had so much faith. At that point, I had another record out. But having so much faith in my records without ever having played with me, that I had a, a session booked in Italy that I flew to around that time, and I booked myself to London just to force an audition on myself in his presence to make sure he wasn't a lunatic. <laughs> <laughs> and so essentially I learned the guitar shop record and played it for him. Um, and obviously things went well, and I was with him for three years and two, two CDs. His playing today is, is as good as it's ever been, and that's, that's, that's a crazy thing to say, but... His his playing, he is still innovative. He's st it's, yeah. it's 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 like he hasn't rested. And uh, have you seen the live uh, live at Ronnie Scott's? Have you seen that? that? Oh sure, yeah. Uh -huh. And you watch that, and you just think it doesn't get better than that. It is impossible yeah. to get better than where he is at right now. And uh, when yeah. and how do you? How did you find to try to to mesh the two of you together? How did you how did you guys pull that off? Was it uh, a mutual thing, or did he just let the leash out and say, you know, Jennifer, just do your thing? You know, I I would have been completely satisfied to just play. Uh, well, I I did a lot of triggering of synth pads with MIDI guitar. I would have been happy to do that and rhythm guitar and not solo at all. Um, but he gave me plenty of solos, and I, I think it's because I approached it as I am there for support. I know my job. It was the same thing with Michael, and basically you do what you're told. And he was he's a really easy guy to work with. Um, in fact, here's what's really crazy, because partly I was crapping myself thinking, you know, this is this doesn't happen to real people. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and when I was, I was in a car with his manager heading to his house, when the manager announced that always in Jeff's band, it was the keyboard player that was the musical director. And then he announced that because I was triggering keyboard sounds, that I was it. And I was pretty much in shock because I was nervous about even being in the band. And now being told I was a musical director was, um, I, I think I still have PTSD from that moment. <laughs> <laughs> Who wouldn't? Who wouldn't? Uh, what did yeah. you, okay, now, now tell me the secret stuff. Did you and Jeff uh, hang out and did you guys just like uh, woodshed together and did you did you teach each other stuff? There was a lot of hanging out, as opposed to Michael's thing where we were in three different hotels and there was 100 people in the entourage. But Jeff, there was 12 people total, uh, four people in the band and two managers and then the roadies. And so we, we'd always have dinner together. We'd always hang out on the bus together. There was a lot of hours together. Um, and it was just fascinating listening to his opinions about music, uh, even being in the studio with him, sometimes I would think, oh, geez, you, you don't need another guitar player on a Jeff Beck record. I don't even know why I'm here. And then there would always be some magical moment in the day where he would say something or have some opinion 
And I go, ah, that that was the golden nugget for the day, and that's why I was here for six hours. <laughs> you know, right. it's, it's very magical. I mean, definitely a, a slice of history I was um, very lucky to be a part of. Did he ever come up to you and go, okay, hey, hey, Jen, <laughs> what did you show me that again? <laughs> what did you just do? Uh, yeah, no, he he's not a guitar geek at all. Not at all. He's more like a singer that just wants to come in and have fun. He just wants to jump in the sandbox and go. Uh, yeah, that was very rare. Uh, I think he he might have showed me a couple things in three years, but we we didn't get down and technical like that at all. I I, I just can't imagine. I would have. Uh, well, I, I, let me flip it around. You said he showed you a few things. Was it stuff that you did you at, literally? Say, hey, Jeff, okay, stop, play that a little slower. What did you do? <laughs> I, I, I want to learn that. Yeah. Little. Did you have a moment like that? No, it, it's just something that happened organically where he was thinking about something. And well, one thing I, I remember for sure is he showed me how to get that harmonica kind of vibrato on the guitar. And I, I've never heard a guitar player that was able to do that. The sound, if you close your eyes, you think there's a harmonica player there and you feel the spit, you know? <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, and, and, and he showed me that and it was just so enlightening. Oh, God, how come I didn't know that? <laughs> but uh, anything he, he showed me of the, you know, two or three things had a lot of impact. Now, uh, was this the, and then we'll move on from Jeff, but was this the, the period where he was... Uh, uh, stop, uh, stopping the use of a pick? He stopped that before the Guitar Shop record with right. Terry Bozio and Tony Hymas. And I, I think it was mostly because he usually practices on the couch and can't ever find a pick. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's where that came from. <laughs> it, 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 but, you know, remarkably... As much, I would say probably 97% of his playing is without a pick. But when he does something like Scatterbrain, the song in 9-8, that's really fast picked, he can pick up a pick and just go. Now that floors me, because if you hardly ever use a pick, to be able to just pick it up and go, um, I don't think I could do that. Yeah, and the, one last thing about Jeff, and, and I'm wondering if you picked up from this, because I I had to go back and and really study and, and try to get this down, is his use of the volume knob. Was that something that you just yeah. went away and went, uh, you know what, i got to start doing that because that, that that's friggin' incredible. Because that volume knob is as much of a part of his sound, the instrument, as the neck or the pickups are. That volume knob is so important. Right. Did you pick up anything from that? You know what? Uh, by the time we started playing together, I think... My playing style and technique was so ingrained, and his was so completely different that I, I didn't even bother trying to do any of that. It's just we were two two different people, two different styles, and it seemed to work well together. I, I didn't even try. Now, what do you when when I and I've listened to all of your stuff over the years when you go into writing mode. Uh, where where does this come from, and what inspires you? And it, it, when and I was talking to you about this earlier, the titles of songs, especially when it's uh, instrumental music, the titles of songs suggest where the songwriter is coming from, but most people don't pay attention to that if they even read, you know, if they even read what the titles are. So, but yeah. for you, the title suggests exactly where this is coming from. So where, where does your head go and what are you thinking about? Um, God, it really depends on the song. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is Tarzan's Day Off. And I, I think I was just goofing off of the riff and realized that it sounded like Tarzan's Call. So that became the chorus. <laughs> and it just made sense. That was my whole focus. Plus... Then I uh, I had some African kind of drums in it, so that, that that actually was a big influence as a child. I would watch Tarzan every Sunday, and they'd always have the native drums in there, and it just took me to a whole other world that I just loved. Uh, something like Glow is 
titles just pop in my head as I'm going, generally. There's a few where I had the title first and then kind of forced the music into it afterwards. Uh, like Unplug This, I had that title. And that, that was all about the MTV era where everybody and their brother were unplugging just because it was the thing to do. And one time I was talking about that on the phone to Jeff, and his response was, I'll unplug for no one. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, unplug this. I, it's kind of a spoof because at the very end I start strumming a C chord as the fade out is happening, but it's a, it's a pretty heavy song. And what about, uh, there's, uh, on your website, you have a video up, um, and in the, in the thumbnail of the video, uh, to your left is a, is that an alien? Is that what that is? Oh, oh, what I, what I just put up tonight. Uh, yeah, yeah, he's, I, I have a different, um, oh, what do you call it? <sighs> Uh, I, the word is just not there. A different something or other that's in the RV for every tour. Last tour, it was Steve Jobs. I have a little Steve Jobs character with an iPad in one hand and an iPhone in the other. <laughs> and, uh, God, there was one, one tour I did in Europe where I had gone to the Vatican and I found this Pope bobble doll. So there's always got to be some character that's at the, the front of the vehicle for a tour and this last one i went to the ufo festival that's an annual festival in oregon and picked up an alien i thought that would be perfect for this tour and uh it this i want to get back to the ufo festival we'll, we'll talk about that in a second this is called uh cruise in the nile and uh, so where what was the inspiration from this was it ancient egypt did you tour egypt was was that the inspiration for the song I never have been to Egypt. Uh, that's, I, I guess I, I kind of see things when I play music and when I write. I just kind of see some imagery. And um, with the sounds and the, the sample of the, the kid singing a foreign language, it just all came together and Egypt hit me. Um, other than that, I don't have anything deeper to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, it's funny because it's called Cruise in the Nile, and and I'm looking at this. I, I guess it's an alien. He looks alien-ish. He looks like a little gray. He's he well, he's a little green actually, in in a silver spaceship. And that's you know what I'm doing too uh, on this tour for the first time ever. I'm doing tour vlogs. Uh, Guitar Player Magazine just put him up the other day. And so I'm, I'm doing video clips and stills uh, in chapters from this tour. And I have one up that's Seattle to L.A. and another one L.A. to Texas. And I'm way behind because we've already gone to Florida and through Nashville and up, up to New Haven. Uh, but the, the alien is going to be in the front of the RV. So any travel shots that you see uh, with the different nature around us, whether it's the Arizona desert or the lush northeast the alien is going to be a constant have you seen anything in the sky yes i did i sure did i was i had my last house in la uh i, I had a covered roof outside in the patio and one night i thought you know i really want to get out there and just get on my back and look at the stars and i wasn't out there 10 minutes before i saw the the iconic three lights just uh, hovering. Just, I mean, my jaw just dropped. I'd always seen it in movies and heard people talk about it, but it was right there above me. And I knew if I went to get a camera, it would probably be gone. So I just stayed there for a couple minutes. And just like you hear people talk about it, just zoomed off. And within five minutes, or maybe just a couple minutes later, there was three military jets that went after it. I just blew my mind. And I, I called my, my alien surfing friends and nobody saw it it was I mean, this was la 17 million people lived there and i didn't hear a thing about it i had the same thing happen uh my wife and i uh i've, I've told the story many times uh so I, I won't get into the details but we were right here in the valley 
And we saw something extraordinary about 1030 at night. It lasted for a couple of seconds, but it was huge. And it, it looked like it landed in downtown Van Nuys. I'm not joking. And I immediately wow. called, you know, people. Did you see? And nobody saw it. And I was checking. Uh, I had the same comments over the years that you just said. There's 17 million people here. How could nobody else? Right. I was looking on KTLA's website, right? KBC7. Right. The LA Times. I'm looking for somebody else to have reported it. And it didn't. Yeah. Isn't that extraordinary how that is possible? You're absolutely right. 17 million people in LA. You've had a sighting. And it's it's like yeah. it, it was just for you. Oh, well, do, do you know James Gilliland? Uh, absolutely. He's got a SETI wrench. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I I, uh, I ran into him recently, and he was talking about all the activity that he has on his property, and it's phenomenal. Orbs like crazy, and grays and greens, and <laughs> you name it. But he said that a lot of times the entities or the vehicles will allow themselves to be filmed. Sometimes not. He'll shoot film, and he'll know he's got it in his camera, and then when he looks later, it's not there. So the way he says it is they, they chose not to be seen. They, they chose not to have that recorded. This triangle that you saw over your house, what part of L.A. was it, by the way? Uh, it was in Newhall. Okay, okay. Not far from Magic Mountain. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, for everybody from where we are, that's about, uh, I don't know, 15 miles from where we are here in the valley. And like you said, okay. it's uh, it's a heavily populated area, and it's it, did it make a sound? That's what I wanted to ask you. Did it no. make a sound? How high up was it? Oh gosh, that's so hard to to gauge. I I, I wouldn't even want to try. Okay, was it solid? Uh, you said there were three lights. You know, was it try? Was it a triangle shape? Could you make out a? Uh, uh, a shape to it, or was it just three lights? It, it seemed like three separate vehicles to me. Oh, interesting. But I, I couldn't see any anything metallic like a saucer or anything. It was just balls of light. Now, uh, you went to the, uh, the UFO convention up in Oregon, and why was it a special trip? Why would you go? Um, well, in Oregon, there's a a bunch of different buildings in the McMenamin chain. And these are brothers that restore old buildings, sometimes historic buildings, and just make these incredible works of art out of them and have art in them. And I had heard about the UFO festival for years and had never gone, and I was finally home. A lot of times I'm on tour when things are happening, but I was finally home and I thought it would be really fun to go down there and check it out and to see a new McMinimins because I, I knew it would be totally groovy. <laughs> so yeah. it was. And they, they had a, a an alien pet contest, which was hysterical. Uh, you know, the, the chihuahuas with uh, aluminum hats. <laughs> <laughs> well, still, those photographs, too, as well, uh, uh, are is some of the best evidence ever. I think they're classic. And uh, I look at those, you know, it's before Photoshop, it's before anything, before digital cameras. And you look at those photographs and you just have to stop and wonder uh, what happened that day up there. It's uh, it's pretty amazing. What do you think of those photographs when you see them? Uh, what do you mean, random photographs of No, of the, the, the McMiniman uh, photographs of, uh, I think they were taken in the 50s. I don't believe I've seen those. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, I thought that they'd be all over the place up there. That's all. Um, with, um, Have you written a song about uh, about aliens? You know, like, I, I hate to go to Joe Satriani, you know, surfing with the aliens. Steve mm. Vai had his mm. uh, Alien Love Secrets album. Uh, by the way, yeah. uh, my bumper music, that the guys that played on Alien Love Secrets, that's who's playing on these tracks here, too, as well. Chris Frazier. Uh, I don't know if you know Chris. Oh, great. Yeah, the drummer. Steve Vai's guy. Yeah. So have you written? Yeah, have, I've seen him, but I don't know him. Have you, uh, have you written an alien song? No, I, I think Steve and Joe got the aliens covered. <laughs> <laughs> 
w- and uh, I wanted to ask you, I, I, uh, we're on the subject of aliens, but what about ancient cultures, too, as well? We were talking about Egypt earlier. Uh, do you study um, ancient Egypt, and do you look at uh, the alien uh, the alien hypothesis with maybe how the pyramids were built or influenced our culture? I've seen a lot of documentaries on that sort of thing, and I think the most fascinating thing was a thing about Atlantis, and I'm not talking about Morissette. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's it is all fascinating. In fact, I saw something not that long ago talking about how there are all, hundreds and hundreds of pyramids that most people don't even know about. Um, pyramids that are still underground, and that whole, that whole thing just fascinates the crap out of me. Do I you, love it. Do you? In uh, fact, I, I've been listening to. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh well, gosh, about three years ago, I started watching Gaiam TV. That's online online subscription service. It's a, a spiritual channel. It's, it's got a lot of meditation and yoga and astrology and all that. But there's a, an incredible interviewer named Regina Meredith. That she was a, a, a pro newscaster for a while, and I, I think she just got sick of the bad news and was very fascinated with other dimensions and UFOs and all that. And she does such an amazing job at interviewing people. Uh, it's, it's like candy for me. I'll just go in there and just binge watch her interviews. She's talked to uh, people like Robert, uh, I think, no, William Tilden, I think his name, a scientist that works on intention experiments. And she'll talk about people deep in the government that uh, are revealing UFO information and Oh, it's it's just something you'll never find on standard TV. It's fantastic. Yeah, Gaia, so uh, ancient cultures as well. Do you feel that uh, you are representative of of what of how culture is looking at uh, the the possibility of us being visited or have been visited or being visited today? Do you think the that the culture is changing and is more open-minded? Do you think you're representative of, of the way society is looking at the subject? No, I, I think I'm pretty much a fringe dweller. I, w- I will say that there are more and more people open to it, but society in general, no. Uh, in part because the government is, is spending so much effort in trying to hide all that stuff. In fact, I... Recent one thing I learned from Guyam that I never thought about is the reason that they would hide and try to make people that have seen these things look crazy is because aliens have free energy technology, and that would totally go against Exxon and all the oil people. It, you know, if all of a sudden we all had free energy. It's uh, it's 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 the way when you look at how many. How many uh, television programs today, Jennifer, you know, like Ancient Aliens or Hangar One, the UFO Files, uh, Ghost Adventures, too. Or, you know, uh, there's so much paranormal programming that's going on on TV that you would mm. you would think that somebody is either trying to send a message or that society is hungry for that. Because the reason why the programming is there is because people are watching it and commercials are driven that way. Right? Does it makes perfect well, sense? Well, you get a point there. Yeah, and... you get a point there. I, I was just thinking that that there's there's a lot. Well, in general, the, the people I hang out with that, that's normal conversation, and we get deep deep into it. And then I travel around the world so much, and I'll be talking to somebody at dinner about it, and get this scoff look like, "Oh, you believe in aliens? What's wrong with you?" <laughs> <laughs> so. You know, I, it's hard to say how many people I represent, but yeah, you're right. There, there are more and more paranormal things out there that are pretty fascinating. Do you? Think, so I, I don't know what what percentage that is that, of people that are watching that. Well, do you think? And you, you you brought this up. Do you think we're getting close to maybe the government being uh, uh, forced into a position of admitting something has been going on? Because of the awareness 
that is out there today? Do you feel, or you know, what would it take for for them to step forward? If, besides the proverbial, you know, UFO in the White House lawn. Uh, I think it would take something like that. Honestly, it would take something that that you absolutely one hundred percent cannot deny before they would admit anything. Especially if they're hiding it because of the oil. Because that's, that's a big economic thing. Oil controls the world. With, um, uh, I, f- I find this inter- in- interesting, so I want to stay on this uh, subject. You said when you sit around yeah. with, with your friends, this is what you guys are talking about and going deep, deep, deep. Are these friends yeah. that are in the UFO circle, or are these friends that are just friends that you just hang out with? What do you mean by UFO circle? Well, I mean, it, it, it's easy to sit down and talk ufology with with people that are in that UFO circle. But if you're out with dinner with friends, does this subject come up? Yeah. Yeah, because all my friends are freaks. <laughs> 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 but yeah, I would say I do have a friend that is pretty tight with. Um, gosh, I don't I don't know what government officials, but he's been given some information that uh, that's pretty mind boggling. I mean, it's very hard to get deep in there, in, in into the military and to get people to talk. But people do talk. When you. Uh... Uh, when you st- you said that you watch videos all the time, is there one researcher yeah. or, or two that you kind of follow, you know, like Richard Dolan or, or Graham Hancock or, or Robert Schock? Is there, is there one that you uh, are attracted to? Yeah, Graham, Graham Hancock is, is pretty mind-boggling. He's, he's got a phenomenal amount of information, more than I've uh, jumped into. Uh, and I would say at the UFO Festival, I was trying to remember the names. They're, they're probably the top UFOlogists that, that gave talks. We, we saw several lectures down there. And although I didn't see the lecture, the, the guy that got abducted years ago. Travis, uh, Travis Walton? That's it. Yeah, he gave a talk down there as well. And I recently saw Fire on the Mountain. That's about his experience. Uh, other than that, I... I you know, I, I gather so much information, I cannot remember where it came from after a while. I kind of binge watch when I get on a subject. I'll just binge and binge. Yeah, I do the same and, thing. Uh, there's so much. Yeah. yeah. I do the same thing. And, uh, yeah, just listen <laughs> Just listen to this show every night. Uh, you'll, you'll, you'll be coming back and checking it out because all of... Uh, uh, all of the researchers that you check out, that's who, that's who we have on this show. And it's just, it's an, ah. extra, it's an extraordinary thing for me to go through because I'm a lot like you. I haven't played with Jeff Beck or, or Michael Jackson, but, but I'm a guitar player. I'm a musician. And, and, uh, you know, I come from that side of the fence like yourself. And now I find myself in the position today of being able to, have these conversations with uh, uh, these extraordinary researchers and authors and ask them mm. the, the questions that you're asking yourself. When you go and you watch a documentary and and you're thinking to yourself, well, I'm able to do that every single night on this show. And it's always another day of, okay. uh, of acquiring knowledge and, and asking uh. those questions. You know, are we alone? You have to wonder, mm. um, uh, I'm sure... When you were a kid, you were looking up at the stars and you were wondering, are we alone? Did you have those thoughts when you were a kid? Well, I don't remember. I really don't. Being amazed at the universe is enough. (laughs) If we are alone, I I, I really don't know when that consciousness hit. No idea. I I think it probably hit first as a joke, like the little gray men that's a fictional thing or war of the worlds kind of thing. Right. And, and when somebody says something to you now, when they, when they come up and tell them, uh, tell you about their experience, you know what you saw up in new hall, you know, up by magic mountain. And when you hear sure. somebody start to tell you, you don't look at them as, as being nuts. Now it's, you know, oh, what I hell mean? No. 
No, no, no. I've I've got a lot of friends that have had some pretty wild experiences with other dimensions and beings, and I I believe it all. You know, if a stranger comes up to me and tells me that, I'm, I'm going to question it depending on the vibe. But you know, my friends are not going to bullshit me as to what they've experienced. Right. So I believe it's real. Um, let's. Uh, we we've only got a few uh, minutes left with each other, uh, so. Uh, tell us, uh, I would like to know exactly what the inspiration is for the self-empowerment for the Modern Musician Experience Tour. Uh, uh, where, did the, uh, where did the idea come from? Now let's start there. And, and how, what is it that you're trying to share? Boy, um, you know, I, I've, I meet so many people around the world, and... When I'm home, I'll do Skype lessons to people around the world, and I find consistently that musicians, especially now, have no idea what's going on. <laughs> you know, the, the old model of making music and hoping for a record deal, is it's done. It's over, and it's, it's come to a point where it's all about self-empowerment, and you can make yourself happen. You don't have to rely on a record company or a videographer to make your video because all of that stuff, all the equipment is so cheap and accessible. Now you can learn anything about anything on lynda.com L Y N D A for 25 bucks a month and really empower yourself to make things happen for yourself. You can learn about video editing, lighting, uh, social media marketing. And I kind of, I was going on a, a long drive and Honestly, I just started downloading all this information and decided it was time for a brand new chapter in my life. Um, I've been flitting around the world, playing in different bands and playing in different situations and going to schools and all that for, for many, many years. And I haven't really had a specific goal for quite a while. And this whole thing just kind of hit me within a half hour, I'll say, um, and I kind of wanted to do it like TED Talks, where it's I had a lot of different subjects that I wanted to talk about, and I wanted to approach these seminars looking at a musician in a holistic view. Not only the music, but tools that will help them be better musicians that weren't available 10 years ago. To I had a, a segment on what I call fuel, which basically creates an awareness about processed foods and Monsanto and um, it, it's all about energizing yourself in a positive way and avoiding things that are going to drag you down. For instance, watching the 11 o'clock news, going to bed and wondering why you're depressed in the morning. Right. You know, right. People, people get into these habits uh, just because their parents did it or it's what their friends do and they do it. And you don't realize how much it affects you. There's only 7% of the brain is conscious. The rest is unconscious and all that negativity, the beheadings, the rapes, the murders, the everything, you take it on in some way. And it's so dark and nasty. Uh, just making people aware of that is what I'm passing on in the fuel department. Then I have a whole other thing on travel because I've been flitting around the world for 30 years and it can be daunting and stressful. So uh, there's a lot of things I have to share about that aspect of being a musician. And I, I tell people how I did my first solo tour because e even though people like to be in bands and it's uh, camaraderie uh, is great. I think that everybody needs to either have a solo show or a duo show as a possibility to book. Uh, for instance, I've got a, an Italian agent for the last few years that will book me with bands. We'll go on a tour, but if, if there's any particular day that he can't get enough money for the whole band, he can still book me. Because I, I made a solo show, I do this multimedia show in sync with film. Uh, so I'm, I'm just uh, letting people know I do this whole module on money as well. And the internet has been around long enough now that the code has been cracked. And it's not just scammers. People know how to make money uh, on it. Uh, one thing I turn people on is to uh, a podcast called Smart Passive Income that's got over 170 episodes of interviews with entrepreneurs. And a lot of people are 
just falling into it <laughs> and and not necessarily they, they haven't been through business school but all of a sudden they're on to something that um for instance just, just a short example there's a guy that wanted to teach his daughter how to tie her shoes and he googled it and nothing came up so he ended up figuring it out making an ebook selling it for five dollars and he became a millionaire within you know a ridiculously short amount of time so I get into a, a deep thing about that, how people can empower themselves and they don't have to, uh, it's not necessary to scuffle and do crap gigs that they don't want to do. And I, in part, was inspired because I was thinking, man, when I'm 70 years old, I don't want to be jumping on planes and going around the world because I have to. I want to do it because I want to. So I, I'm reworking my whole thing right now. And um, it's it's doable. It's very doable. So I'm sharing all the information I've learned about that as well. Do you find that musicians today are in a bit of a paradox in that uh, so many, uh, and there's nothing wrong with the creative process of using samples and using drum samples and, and creating music that way. But the, uh, the paradox that I'm talking about is, is putting a band together, writing songs, and playing for four minutes and actually recording it, <laughs> you know, the, mm-hmm. it, 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 it's, it's kind of weird. Do you find that you actually have to give that advice to, because I think that that mindset is now with a guitar player or with a drummer or it doesn't matter. Uh, okay. I'm just going to play this riff once and then you can sample that for the rest of the song. I'm not going to play for four minutes. You know, it, it's it's kind of this, you know, it's kind of this weird thing where the, being a band is still cool and playing live is still cool. It's it's not a bad yeah. thing. Do you find yourself giving that advice? Um, <laughs> funny you should say that because one of the reasons I started putting together a film show that I could do alone was just a, a history of band members being a pain in the ass and (laughs) anybody that's been out there doing it long enough has been through it and when i start talking about that everybody can relate uh i I started well i'll I'll tell you after 10 years with michael jackson three years with jeff beck i i went home and i thought well my bucket list is done and i'm not dead yet (laughs) so um I started visualizing what it would be like to put a band together and all my past history of putting bands together myself, I just started having memories of all the whining and complaining and people not learning the songs right and uh, having to reschedule or canceling and I just decided, hell with it, I'm going to do a a solo show. So I think it's very important for especially young players that got to cut their teeth on stage. I think it's important. Um, you can't just play with tracks your whole life and expect it to be uh, to resonate with people. Because there's there's a thing with playing with a band that when you when you get the band energy, there's a whole other thing that you can't do by yourself. And I think my solo show would not be what it is if I hadn't gone through years and years of playing with people. So it's it's just a different animal. You know, it's it's a, a different time, a different animal. But you, you look at all the bands that have been successful, and generally there's one writer, like um, Van Halen. He wrote all the songs. He was kind enough to give credit to the other people and divide it four ways. Um, Roth wrote the lyrics, but the music all came from Eddie. And most bands are like that, where there's one person that's the alpha that does most of the work, and but they have the other people around for the band energy for whatever reason. And that's also the reason a lot of bands break up. So I think it's important for a musician that really, really, really wants to do it to empower themselves to, to be able to write. Because some people just go along for the ride. But if you want to really do it, you, you need to contribute. And that's where the the friction comes from when one person is doing it all and people are going along for the ride, but they want the same money. 
I, I'm kind of going spinning off in different directions here. I don't know. If no, I no can't you're exactly right. Um, and uh, now I'm going to ask you some uh, personal questions uh, for me, sure. but it'll resonate out to everybody, and they'll they'll pick up on what I'm. When you track a solo. Do you attempt to, uh, do you, do you learn, I mean, are you doing this at one take and do you play it until you get the entire solo correct or do you go in and, and punch? I've, I've done it all different ways. On my first record, I would jam to the, the solo section for hours and hours and hours and hours. And when I would come up with something that I really liked, I'd record it. And I, I kind of chunked it together with certain phrases that would go together. Um, there are solos that I, I would do down once or twice. And then I, I would say after working with Jeff, that was the first computer recording I ever experienced. It was really interesting to see how they did the record. Um, not who else. You had it coming. There was a, a killer drum programmer in one room. Jeff was in the other and the programmer would deliver these grooves, and Jeff would just react to the grooves. And the producer, Andy Wright, had, was very skilled in hearing stuff go by and knowing what riffs would make a great melody and, and cutting them up really fast and putting those together. It was fascinating. So after that, or, and during that period, um, I got my first Pro Tools system, which cost as much as a house. <laughs> we all did. Yeah. Everybody went through that. Oh, man. Yeah. And so I, I started doing it the same way. And so I would, because your recording is pretty limitless, I would just jam to the solo section for, I don't know, five or ten minutes. And then I would start cutting stuff together. And it was it was brutal. I'd never do that again. Because I, I could... Re play something for five minutes and cutting the best parts could take a week. <laughs> so, it was just ridiculous. And so you find yourself, so, uh, yeah. Do you find yourself now going, you know what? It's best just to, to lay down the entire thought. Let's just get it down instead of going back and punching in notes, you know? Yeah. 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 I, I think the best way really is, because we can take our time and it's not costing $10,000 a day in an expensive studio, everybody's got their own recording system at home, is to go in there when you're inspired, lay down a solo, maybe two, maybe come back in a couple of days, and if you don't like those, lay down some more. And for the most part, take the best one. You might want to comp a couple of them together. I heard that's what the Beat It solo is, is two solos comped together. Right. Yeah, 24, 24 track, two inch tape. You remember those days? <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. I, oh man, I still miss them. Actually, the the sound of it, and and, and, it, and it was Bumblebee. Uh, was that done on two inch? Um. Yeah, it must have been. It had to have been. Gosh. That was in Michael Cimbella's studio, and. Gosh, I, that first record took three years, and I think during the time of that, he went from analog to one of those first digital systems that cost $150,000 and then was immediately replaced by ADATs. Right. <laughs> Boy, did he get screwed. <laughs> yeah, I, wor I worked for Elisis back then, by the way. I was one, I was, I was ah. one, I was one of the guilty parties that uh, uh, was in on that ADAT revolution. Um but was Bumblebee, was that one take? How did you how did you put that together? And don't just it was don't make me angry. Don't tell was, me you uh, did that in one take. Actually, I'll, I'll I'll tell you the little history behind that. I I learned it from some very tattered sheet music of my mother's for piano, and I went through several different fingerings trying to find out the best one. And then all of a sudden, when I was going to record it, I was going to record it to a click. And that just messed me up. And I had to refinger things because I was doing things in groups of five, things that felt easy on the fingers. But when I, all of a sudden, when I had to play to a click, I was like, oh, Jesus, this is a mess. So <laughs> I went back and refingered everything. And um, yeah, yeah, that I had that down enough. I could do one take, and I did several of them. So. 
I think you hear two tracks of it at the same time. And when, it, when it's going that fast, um, it just kind of sounds like a chorus effect when you have, when it's doubled. You know that's not right. To, to be, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer, you're just not right. Uh, I remember the first time... <laughs> The first time I heard it, I said, that's impossible. It's just impossible. And then I saw the video, and uh, you made a lot of, uh, a lot of guitar players uh, jealous. And do you, do you, realize, <laughs> do you realize how many, how many cats across this country were in their bedrooms for weeks? Do you, know, do you realize? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I'll say, I, honestly, if, if I were to play that, Picking it, I could probably do a, maybe 150 beats a minute. But when you get rid of the pick and you're tapping, um, I could get it 200 beats a minute. And it's that's why you get the speed. You get rid of the pick. So there's, well, it's, I have no words. It's just much easier. Uh, I have well, it to... took me a while to get that speed up, but... I have to. There you go. Uh, I have to. Uh, we'll we'll end on this, but and it, I'm sure it's going to be a long answer. Ingve Malmstein. <laughs> yeah. Ingve. So, well, yeah. what what what's your take on Yings? <laughs> um, he is solely responsible for getting uh, probably. 100,000 students to finally give a shit about the harmonic minor. <laughs> I mean, you could not force that down students' throats until he came along. So I'll say that that's a plus. When uh, the, uh, you, you, know, you were here in Hollywood when uh, that Steeler album came out, and I, what, I, he was like, what, 18, 19 years old at the time, and, and, yeah. and then uh, Rising Force came out. And uh, what did you think the first time, you know, what was going through your mind the first time that you heard Rising Force? I thought it was really exciting because it, it came out of left field. Obviously, the chops were phenomenal, but it was a sound that was so different from everything else that was coming along. Um, it was exciting. It was, that's what I thought. And I also got a copy. I don't know how the hell I got it, but I got a copy of the demo that he had sent to Mike Varney. Yep. For yep, the spotlight I've, column. I've got it here, too. And yes. Do you? Yep. I remember he played a blues on that that blew my mind, because it's not that fast harmonic minor style at all. I thought it, I mean, it's been years since I heard that, but I, I thought it was phenomenal. When, so he got a lot, a lot going on. Well, and at GIT at the time, and for the audience, GIT is the Guitar Institute of Technology, uh, which is uh, an area of Hollywood that is <laughs> one to experience to watch everybody walking down the streets with their guitars every single day walking over to MIT. But, uh, it, it, you know, you had that whole Eddie Van Halen, Randy Rhodes thing, you know, uh, that was going on there in, in 79, 80, 81, 82. And then Ingve comes along. And GIT yeah. completely flipped, and and now the instructors there are are are, are instructing that, and, and you were there through that period, right? Yes, yeah, I was. And so you had to, did you have to force yourself to go back and and listen to Rising Force and 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 all of Ingve and and learn those licks? You know, I really didn't get that much into it. I, I did spend a little time. Maybe bringing some things in to show to the kids, but I I didn't get that deep into his style. That kind of wasn't my thing. Plus, I didn't have those kind of chops. Oh yes, you did. Stop. Now you're being humble. Mm, no. Nah. No. No. Now you're being humble. Uh, no. No. But did you ever? Want... Well, I'm. I uh, say I'm, I'm known for playing the bumblebee to a certain <laughs> guitar crowd, but that was the tapping thing. So right. I, I'm normally not a. Wouldn't consider myself a shredder. Did you ever wonder, because I did, and I know this went through your mind, with all of those, uh, probably turned out to be thousands, of, of young guitar players going through GIT, learning and going through and sight reading and, and doing all of this, uh, you know, Bach and Beethoven and Paganini, did you ever want to stop them and go, hey, what, how are you going to apply this to your career? 
You know, what are you going to do? With, there can only be so many Ingve bands out there. <laughs> did you find yourself, because I did, I just wondered what, it's great to play yeah. like that. It is, it's great, I admire it, but what are you going to do with this once you leave GIT? Did you find yourself wondering that? Because they were... They Not were, at all. Not at all. I, I wouldn't want to stunt anybody's passion to go for what they wanted to go for. I, and also, Howard Roberts, who started GIT, his whole idea was to make it... Uh, a trade school, a professional school that was well-rounded enough that when you graduated, you would be able to make a living at music. So even if people were really into Ingve, they still had to learn their chord scales and inversions and arpeggios and learn the, the crap out of the neck. So in theory, they could get gigs doing whatever kind of music came along. And one last thing, uh, and, and again, thank you, Jennifer. You're on tour, and for you to come in tonight and hang out with all of us was just great, and, and I want to thank you for that. Thanks oh, for having me. Uh, one last thing. What's the piece of advice you can give? And you should see Twitter, by the way, lighting up uh, all the musicians out there. They're, so, uh, again, they're thanking you. What's the piece of advice oh. that you can give to all of those aspiring songwriters out there how to write a song when you're getting into that block and you can't go forward. What's that piece of advice to get a song done? I would say buy a book called The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron. It's the most supportive book of the creative mind that you will ever find. And there are tools and techniques to open up your creativity and she knows all the insecure thoughts, all the dark thoughts, all the dark side of what artists go through. And it's it's a phenomenal book that everybody should read every two years. I would say that's more powerful than any sentence I could say. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And uh, it's jenniferbatten.com. The links are right there at Jimmy Church Radio. And... Uh, and when you go over to her website, everything is there. She's got uh, some really cool media. Uh, of course, there's merchandise. And her tour schedule is up on the website. It's all there at JenniferBatten.com. Jennifer, thank you so much. It was a great night. Well, thanks for having me. And anybody that's got any questions, go to the site and click contact, and uh, I get that mail. You got it. Thank you, Jennifer. Behave out there now. Okay, thanks a lot. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Jennifer Batten, unbelievable. Thank you so much. And uh, with that, let's uh, let's take a commercial break. More on Jennifer. I'm going to talk about that. And I'm going to open up the phone lines, 323-825-5045. 323-825-5045. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Jennifer Batten. I'll be back right after this. Stay with us. Hi, everybody. This is Rob Halford, the Metal Guard, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. KGRA Radio. Intelligent Talk. Are you a paranormal investigator, ghost hunter, or UFO sky watcher? If so, FNGInnovations.com has the product you definitely need in your investigations kit or go bag. Introducing the Morpholite Wide Beam Tactical Flashlights that put the light where you need it most. Traditional flashlights shine a focused round beam with limited line of sight in the dark. Morpholite Tactical Flashlights change all that, utilizing a revolutionary wide beam design to enable you to see safety hazards such as hanging wires and steel, pipes and holes in the floor you just can't see with a focused round beam. In the field, where safety is paramount, a 180 degree beam increases orientation and peripheral vision in the dark. Morpholite flashlights are ideal for investigations in abandoned facilities such as houses and hospitals, factories, caves and tunnels. Avoid those low hanging tree branches that poke your eyes in the woods. Visit FNGInnovations.com to see a full line of tactical lights and accessories. That's FNGInnovations.com. Now you can find all your favorite talk radio shows live all in one place at TalkStreamLive.com. Listen from anywhere, office, home, or in your car. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com and click on one of the many live talk show hosts you want to listen to. It's free and easy. No computer? Download the smartphone apps. Never miss your favorite talk show. Find them all at TalkStreamLive.com. 
Hey everybody, what's up? Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and check this out. The 2015 MUFON Symposium will be held this September 24th through the 27th in beautiful downtown Irvine, California. Expanding ufology, opening new doors in academia, industry, and media, former Defense Minister of Canada Paul Hellyer will be there in person. Former CNN news anchor Cheryl Jones, TV news journalist Jaime Musan, and MUFON's chief photo analyst Mark D'Antonio. They're just a few of the growing list of names for the 2015 event. It's September 24th through the 27th at the beautiful Hotel Irvine. Get your tickets today at MUFONSymposium.com. That's MUFONSymposium.com. Go back, Lee Tappy. You want to know a secret? I love ponies. I really love ponies. I'm serious. I couldn't stay sane without ponies to brush. Why fade to black? Because you never got that pony, damn it! This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. All right, welcome back. Fade to black. I'm opening up the phone lines. Let's talk. 323-825-5045. 323-825-5045. You can also Skype in Fade to Black 14. We can talk about Jennifer. We can talk about Coast to Coast this past weekend. We can talk about the news that's going on. Uh, all of that. So I'm just going to open up the phone lines. Let's hang loose for a little bit. 323-825-5045. I just tweeted out uh, right now. That was That's live right now in the studio. Boom. I just tweeted out. You can follow us on Twitter, by the way, at J Church Radio and uh, uh, hashtag F2B. Everybody's retweeting these pics um, or pick. That's, that's my new monitors that are set up here in the studio. I had to do it. And uh, the frustration looks good, though, doesn't it? Everything matches. Everything is the same size. Everything is uh, uh, consistent now. And uh, LEDs, you know, a couple of, I think one of them was still uh, what, whatever. But, but anyway, that's what I had to do. And that's what we went through today. And, and I had to figure it out. This Windows 10 thing was driving me nuts. And that one computer that was acting up, I thought it was the computer. And when I jumped online, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not making light of this at all. You do, when you're trying to troubleshoot a problem like this and you can't figure out what's going on. And when the monitor itself is blipping on for a second and then turning off, you can't all, all the advice I was chasing down online which apparently these drivers were everywhere uh, and these issues, NVIDIA with, uh, with Microsoft and Windows 10, it was leading me down another path. And everything that they were instructing me to do, I couldn't do because the monitor wouldn't work on the computer. In other words, it was a blank screen. So how are you going to go and reinstall Windows when you can't even see? And I was assuming it was the computer. And it turned out to be the monitor. So went out today. Boom, as you can see, new monitors all the way across the board. A little bit bigger. Everything is cool. And you know what? The Studio 2 itself, it's, it's like a couple of degrees cooler in here as well. And, okay, so the phone lines are open. Yes, uh, calls are coming in. 323-825-5045. What's up, Dino? Well, bless you. You forgot to mention, uh, it's kind of a little off subject, but we all appreciate uh, the intention of life, the power of intention, and how it can give us things that we need. And you forgot to mention that Dr. Wayne Dyer died this weekend. He's 75. Yep. Yep. Your, your I, erroneous I, zones and all that, and I know he supported what we do here. Yes, and also uh, Wes Craven uh, passed away yesterday, too, as well. 
and uh, two big W's. You know, that's, uh, oh, you know what? I just forgot Renee sent me in a question for Jennifer, and it's right up here in front of me on my screen, and I forgot to ask her. Uh, because Renee also mentioned uh, not only Wayne, but uh, Wes. Wes Craven passed away yesterday. And, uh, yeah, wow, wow, what a crazy weekend when it comes to stuff like that. But, uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, two guys that influenced uh, uh, an entire generation, you know, and, uh, yeah. I can say personally, Dino, I mean, uh, Jimmy, that uh, that what I have right now, I mean, I've done some things in life. I've learned lessons like all of us as we age. But I can definitely say that what I have where I'm living right now is because of a lot of things I picked up from Wayne Dyer. I mean, I didn't know how I was going to do some things and get the house that I'm in, and I just felt that it was healthy and the right time to do what I needed to do. And like Joe Campbell, Joseph Campbell said, uh, doors opened as I walked down the hall with intention, and I'm now in a probably better place than five years ago had I just let people and circumstances around me guide me and bump me around through the universe. Yeah, and I, you know, and, uh, uh, about Wes Craven, uh, I I didn't realize, and I knew this, but it it it, it kind of hit home. Uh, Last House on the Left, uh, he directed that. You know, it was like 1972, 1973 when that movie came out. I saw that movie in a drive-in theater uh, in Indianapolis, and that movie uh, scarred me for life. Truly, truly. <laughs> scarred me for life but uh that's i i just forgot about that and how uh you know he did other films too vampire in brooklyn it wasn't always a slasher film um but uh but it, that's how far back he goes and last house on the left uh freaked out a, a generation too as well all the way through you know of course uh nightmare on elm street and i'll never forget the first time that i saw that movie i actually I had hard times uh, uh, sleeping after <laughs> the first time that I saw it. I uh, and horror films with me, I enjoy them, but they don't affect me, right? I don't care. It's, oh. They're, they're kind of like comedies to me, but I enjoy them. But well, I'm just the opposite. You know, I I have never enjoyed horror. I think it puts negative energy in the air and it makes me go negative. And that's fine. I can appreciate you doing it. But for me, that's why Wayne Dyer kind of represented a more positive view. And I know people that say, keep America strong, watch more horror and ghost movies. But it just, it's the type of person I am. It throws me off. It's bizarre. It gets me upset. And when I can't sleep, so... I, I wasn't a big fan. I'm not a fan of Stephen King either, even though I think he, he writes interesting stuff. I, just, I can't watch it. It just upsets me too much. But you know you know what's weird? Uh, our daughters, uh, we have two. Uh, I swear to you, I'm not kidding, Dino. The bloodier and the gnarlier, the better. The shock value has to be there. <laughs> if it... A PG is not good enough, man. They don't even want to play around, you know. And, <laughs> and it's it's really really funny to me. They don't they don't look at it because it, they're in another generation. When when you think about uh, movies like Scream, and so, I mean, they, they it, it's got to be really gnarly, and 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 it's 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 funny. Rita just has a hard time. She doesn't you know appreciate that kind of stuff. Me. I just yeah. want to have fun with my kids. And it's just like they don't want to see a musical. They don't want to see a comedy. They want to go for it, man. They want hostile. They want they want all they, they just want to they just want a really the, a really good rated R horror film. And that's the generation that we're part of today. Well, you know, I think that you probably, from what you've told me now, how you enjoy that, and that's a genre you like. I bet you like the hybrid of that, which is horror with aliens in it, which I hate those. I love, I'm not afraid of good alien movies. If they're done well, I love that. But when they have to bring the horror in, like, oh, the aliens are monsters and they're out to get us and they're climbing on the roof, then I, that puts me down. But I bet you love that stuff. <laughs> uh, to a point, uh, to, you know, and, and this is something else that drives Rita crazy. Rita and I have very, 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 very high standards when it comes to film. 
and and when we watch something uh, uh, together, it's with intent, and and we have no problems going back and uh, if we if we're stuck, we'll go back and watch The Godfather, Godfather Two. You know, we'll go back and oh, and great. rewatch a classic. But with me, and it drives Rita crazy. You know what I really love? What? I love nineteen fifties flying saucer movies. Oh yeah, I I love them all. If if something is called uh, Spaceship X to Planet Mars, dude, I'm there. I, well, the day the Earth stood still is the year I was born, and I just always had an affinity for that movie. I I do it all the time. I'll go. Uh, I have a list of of stuff, and I will go and and I try to find one that I've never seen before. Um, you remember uh, uh, a few months ago when I was raving about Robin Caruso on Mars? Yeah, you know, I saw that one. Yeah, 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 it was just one of those things. So I like to go back and 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 watch all of those films. The more famous ones I've seen so many times: Dave the Earth Stood Still or 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 The Flying Saucer. You know, I, I, no, I go off even off of that beaten path. I'll I'll go way way out there because they were made by the ton. And uh, there, there was just so many of them out there, and I'll watch them all, man. I'll, I'll go and and uh, and as soon as I'm off the air here, uh, I don't do it every night, but but pretty much I'll go and and try to find something. It drives Rita crazy. Oh, I, I, I got to say hi. This is great. I got to take a little break. I got to say hi to Josh. He was supposed to come up here and get in touch with me and visit me, and we didn't get in touch, and I see he's on the chat now. So hello, Josh. I'm glad you got back safely. And okay, so we can go on, Jimmy. Okay. We just Josh is one of our great fader knots. What, what chat are you in? The, uh, we always use the chat that you never look at, the one on Spreaker. And we, uh, we don't have to do any uh, hashtag this, that, and stuff, and it gets erased every time. I think it's much more secure than tweet, and we've got a regular group here every night. Well, the reason why I don't go into the Spreaker chat is because my sp- – let me explain something to everybody in Spreaker so you understand. My Spreaker that is running here in the studio – is a console of knobs and faders and screens that is feeding the signal out around the world. So if I go into the Spreaker chat section, which I can, I can look right now, there is uh, 408 posts right now that have happened in Spreaker tonight. And if, wow. I, if I click on that, then it blocks out all of the metering, uh, my net ping information, my connect speed, oh. and all of that. And I need to monitor that and know what's going on. And You need Les sitting there with you as a producer so he can keep track of that and you can just do the interview. <laughs> well, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, it's second nature. Uh, I'll give you an example. Going over to Coast uh, this past weekend, when I go over to Coast, now I've got a producer, call screener, uh, somebody running the console, and all I have to do is do the show, right? So I have Twitter there and, 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 and a couple of computers where I can monitor that and tweet during the show, but I don't have to produce the show or do any of that. And I find myself, during the commercial breaks, I'll go over uh, to the board op, uh, it's Nathan, and hang out with him and, and mm-hmm. talk to him about what he's doing. I want to put my fingers on the console. I want to move some faders. I want to, and I can't do it. So, no, I enjoy it, and it's second nature. So thank you so much, Dino. Let me get to some other calls, man. Okay, and I just want to tell you that I'm working on a couple of things if you want them. I just haven't seen Sammy Hagar lately, but I'm going to get him on the show if you want him. And uh, well, I'm going his, to get to the- his, his people want ten grand. i will just let you know. Well, I'm going to talk to him personally because okay. I see him, and he, he's a Libra, and I'm going to appeal to his fairness. <laughs> okay. All right. Tell him we're not paying ten grand. Thank you, Dino. Uh, well, I'll tell him. Okay. Good night. Okay. okay. I'll talk to you. Hi. You're live on Fade to Black. Who's calling? It's Gordon. Hey, Gordon. Gordon Root. How's it going, man? The... Gordon Root, the one, the only. How are the you? The one and the only. <laughs> my bell's palsy has cleared up. I'm doing a lot better thanks to my Fader family. Um, thank you to yourself and Rita for supporting me on my uh, new uh, novels. Absolutely, um, Gordon. Absolutely. 
Uh, I wanted to ask you, this is a topic I have not heard in years. The Marilyn Monroe death conspiracy. The yes. What do you think about it? Um, I Okay, look, uh, Gordon, and I'm being serious about this too. That FBI memo that you can go to the FBI website and see it. That FBI memo about tapping her phones and UFOs and Jack Kennedy is a very, very, very telling thing. And I, 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 as much as I want to think uh, conventional and just say, you know, she was a, you know, a messed up person, lonely, uh, uh, and it was just she took too many pills one night and it, that was it and she was screwed up for years. That's part of it. Uh, it's possible. But, no, I think there is something to it, man. I think uh, well, they were, the, they, I think they the, were the, I, you know what, Gordon, and then I'll, I, I'd love to hear your answer. I think uh-oh. also that they were paranoid about her talking to Fidel Castro and other dignitaries around around the world about some of the secrets that she knew because she was sleeping with everybody and everybody yeah, well. and everybody was talking to her she knew a lot of stuff you know well you know you you, you have you know and I touch on this in my book conspiracy evolution available at amazon.com by the way um, I touch on this in my book because they say she committed suicide through pills and then they turn around and she, they say that she killed herself via enema? Who kills herself with the enema? Uh, nobody. Because she, according to all of her friends, she couldn't even take aspirin without gagging. But she's going to take a handful of pills? Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> and if, you, if you're going to kill yourself with an enema, you need more than one person to do that. So that means that there's a co-conspirator out there. You know, I'll tell you a funny, 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 funny story about Marilyn Monroe. Okay, uh, I thought you were going to say a funny story about an enema. I no, got worried. No, no, I don't have any enema stories. But I have, <laughs> I have a friend that used to, I think he still owns it, uh, used to own the condo that Marilyn Monroe lived in in Hollywood on Doheny and Sunset Boulevard on the corner. And uh-huh. a really nice place. And uh, I, and I used to spend a lot of time over there and spend the night. We'd go out, you know, hit the strip all night long, and I would stay at his house instead of going back to my place, right? And uh, so anyway, uh, every morning uh, when I woke up at his place, I would be standing out on his patio there, and uh, these people would drive by and look at me and honk their horn. Uh, it would be... Uh, 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 the tour buses with uh, the tourists, you know, the uh, sightseeing buses. Well, like, sightseeing like buses. the death tours? No, Is sight- that what you're talking Well, that too, probably. But right, uh, right. around Hollywood, they have these sightseeing buses. They're everywhere, everywhere, full of tourists. And they would stop and honk and stop in front, and everybody would look at me and take pictures, right? And I was like, what the right. heck is... And it was like weird. And so one day I walk in, I'm like, Paul, What's up, man? It's like crazy. I, every time I stand out in front of your house, everybody stops and takes pictures of me, right? <laughs> and he goes, dude, you don't know? And I'm like, what? And he's like, uh, this is Marilyn Monroe's old place. And I was like, oh. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> I thought it it's was. like being on a macabre episode of Punk, yeah, isn't it? Right, right. I thought it was, yeah. you know, that's where my vein is, my ego comes into play. I thought it was me, right? Well, anyway. Then he, t- <laughs> but then he tells me, and that was creepy, right? And then he, right. then he tells me that he that, that he's got a ghost of Marilyn Monroe at his house, and and then he tells me this story. He said uh, the first night that I w- that I owned this place, it was empty, and these wooden floors, and he says, I'm I'm sleeping in bed, and I hear these footsteps like high heels, walking around my apartment. And I get up and I walk out and I know nobody's there, but I'm getting up and I'm walking around and there's nobody there. Go back to bed, click, 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 click. The the footsteps would come back and I'd go out and and they're there every night. And I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, dude, it's the ghost of Marilyn Monroe. I'm telling you, man, she's still here. And and that freaked. there could be worse ghosts. I mean, well, you know. Yeah, yeah, you're it, definitely right about you that. You could you could be haunted by Harry Carey. I mean. <laughs> And, and um, so then, so then, Gordon, 
when I would sleep at his house, I would listen. I never heard the, heard the footsteps. Well, no, that's what I was about. Did you ever hear or see it? No, never did. Never did. He told me it happened well, every night. After he tells me about it, I, 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 you know, no, I never heard anything. I wish I had, a, you know, something to relay there, but no, I, I can't. Well, look, I can't tell a lie. That would be lying. But before I go, I want to put an earworm in you. The, the whole Jonestown thing. I don't know if you 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 watch a lot of documentaries or not. Um, I've seen a few documentaries late as of late about Jonestown. And they're talking about how Jim Jones was a member of possibly a new form of MK Ultra, the mind control experiment. Yes, I've heard the same thing for years. What, what do you think? Uh, I do. I, I, there was uh, Jim Jones. Uh, I studied it. Uh, I went in depth. When that went down, I was living down in Panama, which is, you know, not that far from where Jonestown was. Yeah, uh, yeah. And uh, so when it hit, uh, it was, uh, we talked about it a bit differently down there in Panama than the rest of the mass media treated it because, you know, it's jungle and, and so forth. Well, anyway, so I went to study Jim Jones later and found out he was from Indianapolis and then went to, you know, San Francisco and, and I, I really got into his background and stuff. And when you have, uh, the ability like he did in crowd control, Okay. Yeah, I'm the talking, power. Yeah. That that thing that he had, he had it in spades and and it was it was taught to him. You know, he learned that ability somewhere. And when I say crowd control, think about what not only what he did in Jonestown to get all of those people to kill themselves, you know, at the snap of his fingers. That's one thing. But back in the Bay Area to get the people to follow him. There. Yes. 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 Yeah. No, let's not forget yeah, well, that. I don't know. What I don't think the government just lets someone become that powerful without having a hand in it. Yeah. You know, Congress was aware of what was going on down there. And and the government was well aware of the the mass exodus of people and what he did and what he set up down there. So they knew what was going on. But the just the ability, Gordon, I don't know what it would take. But I don't think I could speak to people over a period of time and get them to give me all of their belongings and to pack up and leave your family and leave the country. That Where does that come from, that ability? It comes from somewhere, and he was taught. I definitely feel that. I, 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 I don't think there's any question but, about it. Well, well whether well, well, my, my point more... more to the, to the point of being, uh, was he a part of the government experiment, or was he just trained by the government? Do you see what I mean? I, I mean, because I think he got kind of power hungry. You know, he was part of it. Then he saw what, he, what effect he had on people, and then he got power drunk, and then he went rogue. Yeah, and well, that's why they shut him down, or tried to shut him down, I should say. Well, that could be part of it, but I when I say taught... That's what I. It, it could be anything. It could be MK Ultra. It could be uh, so many of. He could have been an act. He could have been uh, uh, an active participant in the program, and maybe the MK Ultra was falling underneath him, and the, his people were part of uh, MK Ultra as well. So it, it, that's what I mean. So I think he was, he was taught, whether it was part of the MK Ultra program, which at that time was in wide practice. I mean, that was the, the, the modus operandi of the CIA was MK Ultra yeah. at that time. and highly classified. Yes. So, uh, yeah, I think he was taught. I think he was taught what to do and whether he knew about it or not. Okay. What, was he a Manchurian candidate? Or did he know what he was doing, and he was taught these methods of, oh, of crowd control? I definitely think he knew what he was doing. I, I don't think it was a matter of he was a, a sleeper cell, if you will. I think he knew what he was doing, and he was awakened to the power that he had and decided, hey, you know what, I don't need you government goonies anymore. I have my own people. Yeah. And it was kind of like a David Koresh kind of uh, foretelling, if you will. Right, right. 
Yeah, but, uh, it, it's amazing to me how, uh, and it's not, it's not a Jim Jones wasn't a singular event, and if it was one example of of something like that, then then we have something else to talk about here. But it happens, and it's happening today. You know, when you look at when you look at these gurus, religious or not, it doesn't necessarily have to be religious, but when you look at uh, sun, or you look at what went down in Japan, or you look at these different cults in the United States, and look at David Crush. It happens all the time, and 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 for us sane people, when I say sane, the people that wouldn't join a cult, you question who would go and do that. Well, okay, it's not one person that does it. We're talking about in cases hundreds, if not thousands. Of people that 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 join and listen, and it's it's amazing to me how it happens over and over again. There, there will be another Jonestown, there will be another Waco, Texas. There'll be another Koresh. There, oh, there you are... know that that's starting already, though, Jimmy. I mean, look look at like you know they passed you know the, the SCOTUS passed the the Equal Marriage Act, and you have these places talking about sanctuary cities where you're quote unquote free. I mean, you know, that is Jonestown 2.0. Well, like I said, it'll happen again. It's happening now today somewhere, uh, probably, you know, dozens, if not hundreds across the United States. But that's just here. It's going on, you know, in South America, Central America, Japan, in Asia, uh, these groups. And another example, I'll tell you right now, as crazy as it sounds, is ISIS. Who in the right mind would go over and do something like that? You know, who would pack up their bags and go? Some, you know, this this appeal to giving up everything to go and join a group seems to be inside of, of, of quite a few people. It's not inside of me. I wouldn't do it, but but it happens. Well, no, they were, they were talking on a, a Real Time with Bill Maher this past week about how ISIS is able to convince people with, without next to, you know, with next to no effort to come join them, come join their cause. And for what? So, you know, so you can go somewhere and be blown up. I mean, you know, wh- what kind of convincing does it take for me to go, Hey, Jimmy, why don't you strap a bomb on and blow yourself up? Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I, I don't know what drives uh, somebody to do that. But it when, one thing is for sure, it's when you're when you are growing up and you're you say you're going through high school or you're going through junior high, you're going through high school, and you see uh, a group, backgammon group meeting at four o'clock after school, right? Whatever, I'm just making stuff up. You're right, but, right. But and you want to be a part of a group, a clan. You see a click over there. You see a click over there. And everybody wants to be a part of a group and be accepted. And and so that that thing, I think, is fundamental inside of all of us, where we want to be part of something. I, and, you know, I have to counter that, though, Jimmy, because a lot of people who have that need to be affiliated have that need to be affiliated are the ones that go and they, they join these cults and they do this and they do that. These are, these people that are getting recruited don't have that. They're not that, that uh, atypical, you know, uh, person who's not included, who's the wallflower, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I, you know, I don't know, Gordon. I don't know. Uh, look, I, I, I haven't seen uh, uh, the mayor of a city quit and fly over to Turkey and cross the border into Syria. I haven't seen that. I haven't seen the manager of a car dealership or, you know, somebody that's got a life and is established and is part of something here give up all of that. It's more of a, you know, it's a smaller uh, a person that is doing that. Well, the one, of them, one of them was a college professor. I didn't know about that. That was... Um... I want to say it was the uh, a month ago. I'm I'm not 100% sure on that, but uh, the guy was a college professor, liberal arts, so on and so on and such. 
And he had been in contact with what he thought were ISIS members, but in fact they were FBI agents who were looking to bust him. So, I mean, it, <laughs> he got, uh, what do you? Uh, he got what he was what? asking for. Well, before I go, I just want to say thank you again to you and Rita for all your support. And I want to give my love to my theater family. I'm talking about Lisa and Les and Gabe and all you guys. You're awesome. Thank you for helping me with my book. Jimmy, I look forward to when you want to interview with me for my book. <laughs> Any because Gordon. because you will be you will be wanted. You will be wanted. I'll anyway. Thank you so take much. Take care, Gordon. my friend. You got it. Bye. That's Gordon Roop, everybody. Gordon popping in out of nowhere for the first time on the show. Right on, Gordon. All right. Let's take a quick break and uh I'll open up the phone lines when we come back after this. Three two three 825-5045. 323-825-5045. Thank you to Jennifer Batten. That was a great conversation. That was enlightening. This is Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. 323-825-5045. More of your calls when we come back right after this. Stay with us. Listen to my boy, Jimmy Church, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Despite popular opinion, reading a book will not make you smarter. But listening to Jimmy Church will. Attention all fade or not. Studio Dome has a special deal on their SD1 Bluetooth speaker. Just go to JimmyChurchRadio.com, click on their banner, enter the promo code Jimmy, and you get $40 off and free shipping on the SD-1. It's voice activated. Comes with a USB antenna, cables, and a carry bag. Never listen to your phone, tablet, or laptop speakers ever again. It's the only way to listen to Fade to Black. That's JimmyChurchRadio.com, Studio Dome banner, promo code Jimmy, Go Beckley Tuppy. <laughs> It's not a lifestyle we chose. We were born this way. KGRARadio.com Hey everybody, what's up? Jimmy Church of Fade to Black and check this out. The 2015 MUFON Symposium will be held this September 24th through the 27th in beautiful downtown Irvine, California. Expanding ufology, opening new doors in academia, industry, and media. Former Defense Minister of Canada Paul Hellyer will be there in person. Former CNN news anchor Cheryl Jones, TV news journalist Jaime Musan, and MUFON's chief photo analyst Mark D'Antonio. They're just a few of the growing list of names for the 2015 event. It's September 24th through the 27th at the beautiful Hotel Irvine. Get your tickets today at MUFONSymposium.com. That's MUFONSymposium.com. Go Beckley Tepe. This is KJCR at JimmyChurchRadio.com. All right, everybody, welcome back. Fade to black. I tried not to be too much of a fanboy with Jennifer, but man, can she play. Hey, I've got a lot of calls lined up here. It's just uh, everybody be patient, all right? I'll get to everybody. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. Who's calling? Hey, Jimmy. It's Josh. How you doing? <laughs> hey, Josh. How are you, man? Doing all right, man. Been out of commission for a little bit. Uh, doing much better. Uh, I was just calling, I was going to, excuse me, I just tuned in and, uh, don't know whether or not you, you all going over this or not, but about that cat that, uh, was a CIA alien hybrid. Yeah, yeah, John, uh, uh, what's his name? Lash. Lash, Lash yes. What's, what, uh, what, what do you know about that? 
Well, uh, there's uh, here in Los Angeles, I don't know what's been reported out across the country, but uh, they're reporting lately that uh, he had uh, he had a pretty crazy lifestyle. He lived with a few different women at the same time. Uh, he uh, was apparently getting his money from uh, these uh, <laughs> these uh, these women out there, and that's where the money was coming in from. He, and he would stay at a different house uh, every night and would tell each one of them a different story. Now, this is what the media is reporting out here. I haven't mm-hmm. spoke to any of these women directly. I, you know, I don't know. But apparently, uh, you know, he was telling each one of them the same story that uh, the CIA was involved and he was half alien and he was an agent and, uh, you know, and he was able to fund his lifestyle through these other uh, uh, women out there. I don't know how uh, affluent they were or how this was, but to acquire, you know, six tons of ammo and 1,200 guns and, and really nice cars and, and so forth to live that lifestyle, money was coming in from somewhere. There was one other thing that was reported over the weekend, and I didn't realize this. Uh, it's not illegal to have 1,200 guns. You know, I, wow. did, I didn't. <laughs> I, well, I, down here in Texas, I don't, I don't think, I don't think you can have as many as you want. But yeah, uh, I didn't realize I that. I didn't know. I thought, I thought there would be some kind of fundamental limit. You know, they'd cut you off at sure. one hundred. You know, but yeah, yeah. But uh, I, two hundred thirty-four thousand dollars or something was reported. That's what we heard that they found just in cash, and also that he had. A, there's like five other lockers, storage lockers. You know, and uh, I, you know, I don't know if that's being suppressed or what, but well, you know. the, what's interesting about the case is apparently none of these other women that were involved they didn't know about the other. They thought that when he was coming over and spending the night at the house, that when he would leave, he was off on some secret mission. But what when he would leave, he would go to the next house and spend the night. You know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and a, a, again, I'm not I'm not part of the investigation, but sure. there's a few different reporters out here that are talking about the case, and it's getting more and more interesting. But uh, was he a half human hybrid uh, in this part of the story? That's that's the part that uh, all of us are the most interested in. Was the sure. CIA actually involved? You know how. Yeah. You know that's that's the part that I would like to know. Yeah, a body in a car for two weeks on the side of the road on a from what they showed on the news clip. You know, there's a sidewalk right next to it. I'm sure somebody walked right by. I'm sure it reeked to high hell. <laughs> yeah. You know? Well, you have uh, to, you have to wonder. Yeah, you, you know, you have to wonder. And uh, why why was the money even found? You know why wasn't why didn't somebody run away with that cash? And that's I find that interesting too as well. Yeah, that, that bizarre. It's just it's just bizarre. I, you know, I find it a lot of different ways. Uh, who, Lord knows, you know. Um, we're my wife and I. We're gonna here in September. We're heading out to California for the first time, and uh, we're gonna go up to San Francisco. Hopefully, catch up with Dino. Uh, get to meet him, and we're gonna come on down to L.A. and uh, just just up for vacation. You know, I'm 50 and uh, retired, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna be the first time we're gonna come out to California, so we're gonna come out there and check it out. Well, you know, let let Rita know uh, what your schedule is. You never know what the future is, and if we're around, maybe we can go have a drink. That'd be great. All right, all right, brother. Have a good Take night. Care. Have a good night, Jim. All right, brother. Bye bye. Yeah, this uh, this lash thing is out of control here. I don't know what's getting reported across the country, and uh, the mass media. It, it's it's pretty funny to me how uh, a story that is this incredible. Why? Uh, it's not reported on uh, uh, a more mainstream situation. And that's the part that adds to the mystery to me, because we all know uh, everything that is spoken about in a mass sense is completely controlled. 
you can't control the local reporters out here, you know, you, uh, well, to a degree. And uh, they are saying what they're saying. The, the story is is getting more and more and more incredible. And uh, we're going to find out. Let's go back to the phones. All right. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. Who's calling? This is Mark from hey, Oregon. Hey, Mark. How are you tonight, sir? Good job tonight. Uh, well, you know, uh, you did a fabulous job on Coast to Coast. I was actually a little apprehensive. I, I was wondering if you could uh, keep up. that the, the show before that you did on the Nazi dysphoria was such an amazing show that I was, I was just a little worried if you could, if you could meet that same quality uh, standard. And you did. You did. Oh, thank Definitely you. Did. Thank you. Well, would, it, it, like, uh, as with any show like tonight, any show, Mark, it's all about the guests. And, and, you know, honestly, I swear, I swear to you, you could do the same thing just as long as the guests are good. Uh, you know, I just happen to be the lucky guy uh, that is, that is, that is on the microphone, but thank you for that. It was a, uh, it was a lot of fun. It was different for me this time around. It was just, uh, you know, there wasn't, uh, uh, it was just fun. I, I, I really had a good time. Well, I had to go to sleep about halfway through the live broadcast, and then I, I listened to the whole thing again this morning. And, uh, yeah, it was absolutely fabulous. Well, you know, I don't remember any of it, just so you know. <laughs> I don't remember. I, uh, that night after I left Coast, uh, you know, it's it's 3 o'clock in the morning, you know, and, and uh, the show ends at 2. I'm finally in my car by 3, and, uh, and I'm driving back, and... My car is, you know, KFI, AM640. That's what I listen to when I drive. Sure. So now I'm listening to myself driving home. And right, that, because they don't, KFI doesn't do it live anymore. No, they do, they it, re- li- no, they do it live, but then they repeat immediately at 2 o'clock. So the show repeats. And, uh, well, they didn't, they didn't have it live on iHeart, and that was, that was confusing. I had to go look somewhere else for it, and I can usually find it right there. Uh, well, anyway, so I'm driving home, and I had it like 10 minutes to, uh, before I get home, uh, and I'm listening to myself. And it was kind of weird. I was like, oh, oh, that's what I said? That was the question. I didn't remember any of it, and it was, it was pretty trippy uh, that how – Four hours can go by like that, and you just don't remember any of it. And I was, I was writing home, and I was like, oh, okay, I guess I sounded like I, I had a brain, you know. And that's that's the way I, I kind of looked at it going home. So I guess it was good. Uh, feedback was great, and thank you uh, because you listened to it. I haven't, but I remember it uh, from a technical aspect. I didn't mess up anything. I didn't trip over any cables. I didn't uh, get any phone calls from the head of the network telling me to get off the air. So I guess <laughs> for that, I'm, I'm, uh, so I'm going to call. I'm going to call George and get on the producers over there because you know you deserve a chair. Oh, and stop, uh, I'm just stop. not going to put up with it. <laughs> oh, stop! Thank you so much, man. <laughs> and uh, Jennifer Babbitt tonight. You know, wow, Batten, Jennifer Batten. Ba- B- Batten. I'm sorry. Yes. You know, and the thing was before tonight. And and I you know I'll plead ignorance here because I had really never heard of her, and I've always been one of these guys that that played music and wrote music, and I isolated myself from from the radio, and and you know broadcast, so I could keep my own writing straight, so I never would be influenced by that. But I admit I clicked over and I listened to that uh, flight of the bumblebee. Oh, it's insane. And I I would claim I can play that fast with a pick, but someone might make me try to prove it. <laughs> she um, that is phenomenal. Yeah, she flipped out Hollywood, man. Uh, there's so many good players here in town uh, that uh, she flipped everybody out. Mark, hey, listen, I'm gonna I'm gonna get to some more calls. Thank you so right. much, man. All right, Jimmy. I'll Hello. talk to you. Thank Please you. Please state your name after the tone, and oh. Google Voice will try to connect you. Well, so much for that phone call. That was bizarre. Google Voice. I don't even know what Google Voice is. Yeah, Jennifer freaked out Hollywood. Um, when back then, in uh, it was so competitive. It's competitive today. Nashville is competitive today. Oh, look who. Uh, I'm going to go straight to the phone lines on this one. What's up, Steve? 
What's up, Mr. Jimmy Church? I got your package. Thank you. Oh, but you got the mug. <laughs> yeah, man. I, I'm, I'm privileged. I, I, I'm, I'm almost hesitant to use it. I just want to keep it fresh. But I, I you know, <laughs> uh, today in the studio, I was going to uh, use it and take some pictures of it. But man, it's, it's just so clean, and it's the only one. And more on that later. Let's not talk about it. If I post a picture, then everybody will know what we're talking about. But anyway, <laughs> thank you. I got it. What's cracking, my brother? Well, I want to talk a little bit about what went on in Roanoke from, from the Fader night. Yeah. You know. Sure. You know, because, you know, Jimmy, that's just not quite an hour and a half for me. It's right you know, and, there. Yeah, yeah, it's right there. And uh, my secretary, she uh, she watches uh, WDBJ7 uh, every morning. She has it on on that uh, when she comes in because she watches, I think, uh, Kelly Ripa and Michael Strahan that comes on after that, and she had, she had that on, and um, we watched that live. I mean, we saw it straight up live. Oh, you did? Yes, I mean, we were, you know, that's one of our local, you know, channels for us. And I watched it, you know, straight up live. I was in the office, and we just, just hear bang, bang. I wasn't paying really much attention, you know, to the TV, and then you just hear bang, you know, bang, 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 and some screaming, and then it got, you know, it got my attention, and then, you know, it went to the, uh, you know, back to the studio there, and then they were just dumbfounded in the studio and you know they I think the one girl uh, said you know that obviously something has went terribly wrong and you know and, you know they cut cut away from it but uh I had heard it was crazy well, well you would know more about this so what I had heard and read was that uh, they were immediately when everything happened that they were like texting back to them you know, what's going on. And of course, nobody responded back on the text. So that's a, you know, it probably took a few minutes, you know, a minute or two for them to even come to grips about what had happened. And was that what was going on on the television? They didn't know right away, did they? They had no clue. They just kept saying, um, you know, that there's something that, you know, has apparently went, went wrong and, but I, I guess, you know, they were seeing the live feed in the studio, the, you know, the broadcasters there, because you could just see the look on their face. Yeah, I saw that. that. Yeah. That, I mean, they, that they were shot. And that, the one woman that was on there, she was, she was just dumbfounded. Well, uh, Steve, tell me what uh, that part, uh, you know, in Roanoke, and I know you've you've been there many, 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 many times. There's not. Uh, what's the environment there? There's no crime there, is there? It's. Uh, there's, yeah, I mean, there's no crime there. I mean, there's no really no crime in to speak of in this this part of you know Southwest Virginia. You know, I could. I, the only time I lock my doors is when I go on vacation. And and yeah, when I hear uh, people talk about, and I, it, it 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 infuriates me, but when they talk about, well, you know what they, he just walked right up on them, and and they were acting like you know, and it's because they're not expecting somebody with a gun there because it just never ever happens, does it? No, and then if when you watch the, I guess the GoPro that he had on his chest, you know, he walks up to him. Once, and you know, acts, I guess acts like he's start is going to start to shoot him, and then ba then backs away. Yeah, and then yeah, go steps ahead. forward again and and shoots and then shoots her. It looked like he was trying to get their attention, and they would right. It looked like he was trying, and they they you know they were into doing what what they were were doing with the job, you know. Right. What's the uh, what's the atmosphere like around there now? Uh, you know, uh, uh, are people talking about it every day? Is is there any 
false flag conversation that's going on there? Uh, no, you know, it, it no one, no one spoke of anything, but you know, with false flag. And um, now, one thing that I, there was a few things that I thought were strange that that went on directly afterwards. Um, the governor actually came on WDBJ seven. Um, probably 30 minutes after it happened and well, you know, was tell, <coughs> excuse me, was telling the public that, you know, they've, I guess they had located the guy and they were in some sort of pursuit w- with the guy. But the first thing the governor said was, um, he went to gun control. I mean, r- right off the bat, he went straight to gun control. Yeah, we got to do something about gun control. Right out of the governor's mouth, right off the bat. Yeah, and and I heard her dad say the same thing. It was like, you know, it was hours after, and it was the first thing that came out of his mouth too. Now, look, I'm not, I'm not jumping on the uh, crisis actors that they were actors, and all of this was staged, and it wasn't real. I'm not jumping on that bandwagon. I am not. But the bandwagon I am jumping on, which is amazing to me, the gun control conversation that is happening today immediately from her dad, from everybody else, from the media, uh, from the governor, everybody jumped on that uh, immediately. And that's the part that I find disturbing. And I don't I, I just don't understand where that mentality is coming from because it shouldn't take an event like this to bring up the conversation. Do you follow me? No, that, if you believe, right. if you believe that, then you should have been, the governor should have been talking about that weeks, the day before the event weeks before it should have been part of his campaign. Somebody right, it should have been part of his campaign. Right, right. It shouldn't be somebody has to die. And then you're talking about it because then it's like you are, um, you're riding a wave, you know, you're, you're, you're doing something else for the platform. And that I find disturbing to me, either that that's your belief and you've been always speaking about that or not, but somebody shouldn't have to die. And then you bring it up, you know, and that right. I, I, it's, it's, it's weird to me. And give me, I, I am an avid gun owner. I, I'm, uh, Way more guns than than is necessary for a person to have. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um. The they ha they are going to have to do something with some kind of with gun control, and especially with stuff we have um, here. What's called the the trading journal. I'm sure most towns across the country have um, these small. It's a small newspaper. Comes out weekly. And, you know, people sell cars and boats and, you know, office of supplies, whatever, and guns in these trading journals. And every week there are two to three pages of of guns that you can just buy from, you know, people advertise in this trading journal that, you know, these guns aren't registered. You know, and you can buy as many from anyone, you know, that's, they can do whatever they want to with gun control at, you know, at the stores. You know, they, they're going to have to do something to stop the individual from selling guns privately. in an open market yeah, like private, that, privately pri- like privately. that. Yeah, if uh, you're selling a gun and you're not going to check somebody's background when they come over to your house, you know, right. you're not going to do it. And I don't know how many guns are for sale on Craigslist, but I bet you it's a buttload. Uh, you know, are, are, you, are you checking, you know, doing background checks? Uh, you know, I totally understand what you're saying. Every town has yeah. got that local newspaper. You know, the penny right. saver, whatever. I just said penny saver. I don't know if penny saver sells guns. But, but you know, those types of magazines that are, you know, local papers where everything is sold. And if you are advertising on there as a private individual selling your guns, where where is the control there on background checks or who's buying what? 
Um, yeah, that's an interesting point. I've I've, I've thought about there is that. A lot. Well, you know, when you go to uh, when you go to a gun show, do they do background checks there too as well? I don't know. Do they? I don't know. I, I've, I've been to several gun shows and I, I bought several guns at gun shows and didn't have a background check done on me. Right. Just bought just bought the gun just like it was like I bought it out of a, a trading journal, yeah, you know, or right. or a flea market. You can go down to every Saturday here in Tazewell County. They have a a quite large uh, flea market, and every Saturday you can go down there, and I guarantee you there is probably anywhere from a hundred to two hundred guns for sale at that flea market every Saturday. Yeah, I was uh, I went to a house once. This is about. Oh, well, it was about 20 years ago. I'm not going to say when, or I mean, or where or anything like that. But I, I walked into this house, and there was a pool table there. And I look over on the pool table, and there were boxes and boxes and boxes stacked up on it. I thought, man, how can you play pool with all that stuff on the table? And I walk over, and I take a closer look, and they're all handguns, right? Just, just right. hundreds of them. I'm like, what's up with that? Oh, you know, you know, I'm, yeah, I, yeah. I was like, wow, and that was a private guy, private, private, and and I could have forked over, you know, anybody, and 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 left with a couple boxes of uh, uh, full metal jackets, I suppose, you know, and and it was it was pretty trippy to me. It was uh, something that I don't think was unusual that goes on. You know, these private collectors, uh, you know, they, they buy whatever and sell whatever, and, and, and that's it. I, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know how that part of the, the world works, but I doubt that somebody is running a fax machine back to uh, the FBI or whoever you're, you know, you need to do your background check with. I don't think you're doing that. You're not making a copy of somebody's driver's license. You know, you don't no. know where they live. You don't know anything. Yeah, that's a, no. that's an interesting point. So, and, you know, I'm surprised that the that the cartel hasn't figured out something about uh, you know with trading journals and uh, you know these penny saver you know magazines. I mean, that they could come in and buy thousands of guns with that, and they'll have to worry about any background check and ship them across. You know. The border. I mean, it's just, it's ridiculous. That is one, you know, one thing that really, to me, that's the one thing that they really have to address. Yeah, look, look there's no, nobody smarter than a criminal. So I'm sure that right. they know. <laughs> just, they're going to find, yeah, right. Yeah, they, they're they're going to find a way. That's, yeah. that, you know, that's what, you know, gun control, you know, I've said it a thousand times, you know, we need to have some kind of gun control. Thank a you. criminal is going to get a gun regardless. Yeah, yeah, you can outlaw it completely, and it, it doesn't matter. You can stop it. The it don't matter. No, you can, shut right. down, you can shut down the manufacturing of it, and they're still going to build them. You know, right. I, I'm sure the best AK-47s that you can buy in the world are handmade in the mountains in Afghanistan somewhere. You know, so let's, yeah. let's not be foolish about that. All right, man, I'm at the end of the show. Thank you so much, Steve. Thanks for the time, Jimmy. Behave and be well. Hi, brother. Steve from Bluefield. Wow, I got to get out of here. I ran it to the bloody end. Let me do this. Let me click. All right. Thank you to Jennifer Batten. What a great conversation tonight. Do go to her website, jenniferbatten.com. You can go to Jimmy Church Radio. Everything is there. Just click on it. All of her information, tours, and... There's, there's media, there's videos, there's music. It's all there. JenniferBatten.com. Show is produced by executive producer Rita Kamarian. Show is produced by Hilton J. Paul, Mark D. Kovar, LJ3, Renee, Mark Dunbar, and Jonas. Announcers are Steve Harder, Gene Vito, and Mark D. Kovar. Fady by Dale. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Music, Doug Aldridge. In, intro, Space Boy, SpaceboyMusic.com. Faded Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network. Syndication by KGRA The Planet. Uh, tomorrow night, Vahan Setian right here on Fade to Black. This broadcast is owned and copyrighted 2015 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network and cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, 
or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Be safe. Go Beckley Tepe. Yeah.